Test, test, one, two, 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 three, three, two, one, check. This is a microphone test. Testing one, two, 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 two.
Mic check one, two, three, testing one, two, three, four, five, six, community room one, checking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Would members of the Licensing and Standards Committee please report to Committee Room 1 for quorum? Committee Room 1 for quorum. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. We have a quorum, and I'd like to call this uh, meeting to order. And, and welcome to the 22nd meeting of the License Standards Committee. As chair of the committee, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to members of the public and those who are watching the proceedings online or TV. For those of you who are in the committee and want uh, to, to follow the proceedings, we have the TV screen at that corner of the room, and that provides real-time updates and with regards to where we are in the agenda and what's coming up. The Licensing Standards Committee gratefully acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas or the new Great uh, First Nations, the Haudenosaunee and the Huron, one that and home of many diverse indigenous people. Any conflicts of interest have to be declared under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, no knowledge. Can I have a motion to confirm the minutes of September the 18th, 2017? Councillor Di Giorgio, all those in favor? Against? Carry. Any communications? We do have, uh, I believe, a new communication from the Vice Chair, Councillor Carigianis. With regards to this communication, <coughs> this will have to be added to the agenda. Is, uh, can I have a motion to add this item to the agenda? Councilor Kerjani, all those in favor against, carry. And I'm going to ask the clerk to, um, to pass around this, this communication so members of the committee will have an opportunity to look into it. And, um, do we have any other communications? That's it, right? At this time. At this time. So now we have, we do have three items in the agenda. And, uh, and we also have the speakers list, and that's the, on the green sheet. So I'm going to go briefly through the agenda, and I will hold down any items where we have the speakers. And uh, the first item, LS22, Point one, results of consultations on Chapter 510, holiday shopping. We have speakers. I'm holding that side. item down. The next item, LS 22.2, .2, dogs in schoolyards. And um, there is no speakers. Uh, Councillor Davis. The. Um the recommendation is to forward it to, to the school, city school board's advisory committee, and they do not meet until the 25th. Um, so I'm wondering, though, if there is a report, oh, maybe that's what we do. You do a report. Councillor Davis, is, I do have some questions on this item, so is, uh, let's hold this item down. Okay, I was so going to suggest it during it a month until Okay, the great. And the next item, LS 22.3, and that's natural garden notification to council war offices. Is, do we have... The, I have questions on that. Can so, we... So, Councilor Nunciara, questions on that, so the item is held down. So, so we're going to have a good discussion, I guess. Now, before we proceed with um, the first item, for the benefit of the public, I'm going to ask the staff if they can just give a quick presentation on the item, and then we'll take we'll go into deputations. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you and good morning. 
Um, the purpose of the staff report that is before you is to seek direction from committee and council on clarifications on the prepared meals section as a result of the Longos cases that have been uh, through the courts over the last few years and the appeal. Um, it's brought here for direction because we need to remove the ambiguity in our current bylaw. Um, we need to be clear to businesses, to employees, to the public, and clear to our enforcement officers. Um, the City of Toronto does not provide us with the authority to make some of these decisions, and um, it's a challenging issue that has been uh, before this committee and council over the last number of years. Um, our report has a uh, recommendation in it that is asking for you to make it a little uh, uh, stricter or to, to have two options, either to have a more permissive or a stricter piece to define prepared meals, one on prepared meals or one on um, uh, retailers that serve food. So again, it's a very challenging issue. It's been here a number of times, and uh, the reason it's here is specifically on the prepared meals piece, nothing else. Um, while prepared meals is an exemption, what we really need from you today is some clarity so that we can uh, clear up the ambiguity that is currently in the uh, prepared meals definition. Great, thank you. So on that note, as chair of the committee, I just want to remind everyone, as city staff indicated, that uh, the issue of holiday shopping was considered, was considered by city council in April of uh, this year. And, uh, and because of the decisions that were made by the city council, various decisions, the um, holiday shopping by law and the decisions of council restricts this committee in terms of debate or further motions that members of the committee may want to play. So I just want to be mindful about, as I would like you to be mindful about that. So the item before us deals only with, with the public, cons public consultations that were undertaken by MLS and the impact on the expanding the application of the prepare meals exemption and the holiday shopping by law beyond restaurants. And that was explicitly noted by council that was to allow all the retailers like grocery stores who sell prepare meals to operate on public holidays. So that's the, the essence of it. The item does not deal with the broader issue of holiday shopping. So I just wanted to to ask before we start the deputations, I want to ask public speakers that uh, to keep your remarks focused on the topic, or I may have to rule those your remarks out of order if we are not within the topic. Having said that, you're going to have five minutes, all the deputants to speak and to address uh, the committee. There are two timers, one in the back and the other one in that corner for you to keep track of, uh, of the time as you speak. And with that, we'll proceed with uh, members of the committee. In terms of questions to city staff, I think let's hear, I would like to suggest that let's go through the deputations first, and then we can ask questions to city staff on the whole thing. Are we okay with that? Great. So we have, um, a number of speakers, I'm going to call the first one, Gary Sands, followed by Mark um, Hennessy and Gary Regas. Gary Sands. Gary Sands, Senior Vice President of the Canadian Federation of Independent Grocers. We'll go to the next one, Mark Hennessy. Good morning. Good morning. So I can see that we have uh, three um, deputants. Are you all rested and all you have five minutes. Uh, we did, but uh, the, the response, initially we did, but the response was because I'm the main speaker or the only speaker, 
um, uh, my colleagues here will be here to answer any specific questions around collective agreements or if there's anything specific to the grocery store network because they represent the two locals of the workers most affected. It would it be possible to have uh, your names, please? Okay, sure. Uh, my name is Tim Dielstra. I'm with Local 175 and 633 of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. Thank you. Paul Doherty, uh, Executive Assistant President for U UFCW Local 1006. Fantastic. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. On Is behalf that? of uh, the membership of UFCW Canada, I want to thank and welcome the opportunity to, be, to appear before this committee today to comment on the hop, uh, holiday shopping bylaw review. Um, we've already introduced the two colleagues uh, to my right. Who, both of whom represent workers in the grocery, retail, pharmacies, and retail more broadly. UFCW Canada is Canada's leading private sector union. Together, we are more than a quarter million of Canadian workers strong. Across Toronto, we represent tens of thousands of members. Together, we're building stronger future for UFCW Canada members, their families, and communities while protecting and promoting employees' rights and social justice and equality for all. UFCW Canada is a leading force for workers in the retail food processing industry and hospitality sectors. Our members are your neighbours. They're the grocery clerk or the cashier you've gotten to know. They work in meatpacking plants and hotels. Some work in nursing homes, drug stores, food processing plants and many other sectors of the economy. We are here today to say that we oppose the recommendation of expanding the prepared meals exemption as it would have a significant negative effect on our members by allowing more grocery retail, retail and possibly including pharmacies to open on statutory holidays. For decades, the City of Toronto has intended for prepared meals to mean restaurants. UFCW would like the City to continue to do so. We feel that the whole purpose and intent of the bylaw is to provide citizens of Toronto time off from work to spend with their family and friends. By expanding the definition and allowing more businesses to open, this committee and council will be changing that intent and quite frankly taking statutory holidays away from thousands of workers and residents across the city. This kind of change goes further as it actually attacks a specific sector and group of individuals. The retail sector is considered largely precarious due to mainly being part-time and, uh, and, and most being at lower wages. It's a sector made up of a majority of women, students, and newcomers to Canada. In such a precarious sector, these workers look forward to time off with their family and friends. These nine statutory holidays represented the definitive time where they could plan activities outside of work. Again, let's be clear, we're talking about nine days in an industry in a sector that would run 365 days if allowed. And in fact, the stores that are currently affected uh, by expanding this definition already operate on every other single day except for those nine statutory holidays. If the bylaw was amended to allow more stores to be open, our members would also be faced with the extra stress of having to find childcare on a holiday. <clears throat> a study from the Canadian Centre of Policy Alternatives shows that in Toronto, the average childcare fees for infants are $1,649 a month, toddlers are $1,375 a month, and preschoolers at 1,150 a month. This committee and council would now be asking parents to take on the added costs of childcare on these nine holidays. That is, of course, if they are able to find childcare spaces open on such holidays. For our members who rely on transit, there would now be the added stress of getting to and from work on these days. The city runs a reduced transit schedule on these days, making it more difficult to plan a route to and from the workplace. This Two, could also potentially increase the costs of childcare as well if extra time was needed for travel. UFCW finds it odd that cities are making these kinds of changes in a time where mental health issues are on the rise. Studies now show that one in five Canadians will experience a mental health illness in their lifetime and that by 2020, depression will become the second leading cause of disability. As a society, and to you as stewards of that society, we would consider adding why would we consider adding more to people's anxiety or stress? It's for all of these reasons, the loss of family and rest time, the cost and access to additional childcare and transit, and the additional stress and anxiety added to what is often already a difficult family work-life balance, that we oppose moves such as this, which would remove holidays from the city's residents, including our members. And since I still have a small amount of time left, I just want to mention that we did actually survey our members on this issue 
it's sort of in its infancy, but already within just a day, we have about 99% who would be opposed to having more stores open or their stores open, particularly. And that was a direct survey with our members. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much for your presentation. You were right on time, actually. Great. Is, um, I'm sure that we have a lot of questions for you. And these three members of council, any questions? Members of the committee. And uh, Council Burnside, please go ahead. Thank you. Through you. Um, you in terms of the unionized environment, let's uh, let's use Loblaw as an ex as an example. Um, is there not an agreement where if uh, employees work on stat holidays, they get time and a half? I'm going to refer to some of the folks who represent the collective agreements. Yes, there is. There, there absolutely is. But uh, so you don't think, given that um, I know now. That environment has changed and there are a lot of low paying jobs or is that not didn't used to be the case 20 years ago um, do you not think that some people might want the opportunity to make time and a half based on the based on what we've done with our surveys and, and uh, respectfully well, the way the business is going now which is actually about going 24 hours a day uh, the majority of our members have uh, voiced to us that the, the money isn't the, the important thing at this point in time, it's the, the time that they have off due in fact of the limited days that they, they get uh, with the business demands of now. So unfortunately, the money that you talk about and somebody getting time and a half or double time, uh, with a lot of our members, it's, it, the time off has been outweighed by the money that uh, they're presented. And we find uh, there's, the business is having a harder time trying to find people on a holiday when, now, they're, when, they, when they're forced, to, when they're forced to, to come in if they have to be scheduled. The majority of our members would say, I would rather be at home and forego the money because of the limited times that I actually get. Okay, but aren't a, mo a lot of your members part-time? So wouldn't they have days off just generally? I always thought the struggle at Law Blas, at least when I was there, was actually getting hours as a part-timer. We've been, we've been uh, progressively working uh, with uh, Loblaw's company, especially with Great Food and RCSS, to have uh, better scheduling. And we have found now with uh, better scheduling that what has happened is our members now, they'll get their hours, but they still have to have other opportunities to work for other jobs because with the cutting of hours, it's unfortunately allowed them to get hours at Loblaws, but then having to go out and seek another job. So really, they're working two and three jobs that in a week. Okay, um, thank you. And But now, in the, in the unionized environment at least, I know we're not just talking about the unionized environment, but I'm pretty sure Loblaws wouldn't be able, I'm just using Loblaws because that's what yeah. I know, they wouldn't be able to compel workers to work with Yes, they, yes they would. And you, yes, and you as a union can't help them? Unfortunately, with, with the language that we have since our conversions language started back in 2010, there's, uh, there's language within our collective agreements that say the company uh, has the ability to schedule the particular part-time and even our full-time members, giving, giving them only 24 hours notice, in some case 48 hours. And so that from retrospectively and respectively when yeah, when you're longer, around yeah, and, yeah. I, and I and I I'll leave that generically um, with the change in business practices right. the the guarantees that we used to have in the conventional stores yeah. uh, we don't have right. those anymore so there's no exemption we continue to, f to fight for it yeah there's no exemption for stat holidays in that language not exemptions uh, what they in terms use. of the compelling people to work within 24 hours unfortunately the compelling of 24 hours and 48 hours half okay and then and then my last question is sorry to, to you uh, mark yeah. mark um what would differentiate i mean you made a sort of a general statement about um the access accessibility of uh, child care so what would differentiate um, retail workers in that um, in that challenge from let's say someone that works at a gas station or someone that works in a bookstore or antique store or in the restaurant industry what what makes you know you're asking us to to I, to have a specific policy 
directed at, well, you said precarious work, but I would think that the restaurant industry is precarious as well, um, that you're asking us to have a specific policy for retail workers where that doesn't exist. I'll even just use, we can just narrow it down to restaurant workers. What, why would we differentiate? Or should everything be closed? Well, yes, one, we would agree that everything should be closed. Uh, we already have the tourist zones, so I know that they're, they're not going away. So I know that some places will be open, we agree. And we, we know that, the, that those areas are already open. Um, so yes, one, everything should be closed. There is no differentiation between the two groups. I think they both face the exact same challenges in trying to find childcare for those days, no matter what. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bernstein. Any other questions? Vice Chair Kalijanis. Thank you, Chair. Through you to, um, to the deputants, thank you very much for coming. And I'm looking forward to listening to some of the other deputations made by the workers themselves. Um, I realize that, you know, when you want to sit around the table at Christmas time, Boxing Day maybe, Thanksgiving, if you're called into work, your members will be um, having a difficult time saying to their family, I will be there. I realize that would, um, if somebody that's working at, um, at La Blau's or in, in any other store like this, um, they might have a difficult time in finding somebody to look after the kids. Schools are out. Um, so what, what would happen to, to those families that um, have kids, single moms uh, or single dads, and where would they leave their kids? I mean, school is out and daycare, uh, daycares are, are out. What happened in those, to those families, those, I believe, nine days that we're talking about? So, to understand your question, you're saying that um, how are they finding childcare right now? Well, what would they do? What, 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 I mean, if we were to force them to go to work, what fallback will they have in childcare? I mean, if they have little little ones. Well, they they have to spend as much time as possible looking for that childcare. That's our that's that's our point. Saying that for them, it's another added stress of trying to find those childcare spaces. So, if the the regular daycares that they normally go to are not open on those days, then that means they're now looking at private babysitters or uh, or families or friends or whatever whatever they can do to do that. But to do that on last minute, or even just to do that in general, no matter what, is extremely difficult and stressful on a family. Um, they would, if they have to go, and they don't, you know, usually would, we we would encourage them to take TTC. Now TTC is running on a week, I mean, on a holiday schedule. Yeah, that will take what a half an hour, an hour extra for them to be to go there. Uh, from what we could gather when we looked at it, probably an extra hour either way, depending on the timing of the schedule. To so get if they're working an eight-hour shift, they're looking at 10 hours, yep. never mind Thanksgiving dinner or, or Christmas dinner, right. and the private babysitter that they have to find, it's for a 10-hour shift. How many, how many people do you guess from your, in your union will be put in that position? Give us a, a, a ballpark number. In terms of families? Let me let me ask this. Let me let me. How many people does this? If we were to allow um, during those holidays for people to work, how many of your union members? How many people in your union will be affected? Roughly. Well, in in our particular uh, local, uh, we have uh, no frills. You're independent grocers. We have uh, Loblaws Grapefruit and RCSS. We have um, thousands. If you want to. Uh, if we can bulk park it, I would say anywhere between 3,000 individuals, uh, maybe more, in regards to just at our grocery uh, in uh, Great Food RCSS. Then we have to look into our no frills that are in the in the GTA. So out of these thousands, three thousands, is it 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent that would be affected? 40 percent, 50 percent? On that particular day? On that particular day that they have young families. Any any guesstimate? To be honest with you, sir, uh, I, I couldn't, uh, I, I would be lying to you if I ballparked and, and, and give you a, an honest. Is it 10 percent? Is it 20 percent? Is it more than that? What would Families you with us, yes. It would be anywhere between 20 and 30 percent that, that I, I, that if I was off the top of my head. So if you got 3,000 people that are working, 
30% would be anywhere between 800 to 1,000 people that would be affected, that have little kids, that will have to find daycare in order to look after them. One corporation. That's just, that's just one segment. Okay. That's just, just one segment. There's others, we have pharmacies, I mean, from our other locals. <clears throat> so if I could add, from my local, we would probably have between just the grocery retail that we represent here in the city, about 1,500 workers. I would say out of that, a good 40% would be affected by this, where the store would be open and people would be required to work. And then additionally, what's being contemplated, uh, as I understand it through these changes, is looking at opening large pharmacy, which would include our members at Rexall Pharma Plus, at which point you have another 1,000 uh, members there, and so you'd have a 40% uh, look there so where people would be required to work. not one or two families. We're talking thousands of families that will be free. We would be talking about thousands of people who would now be affected who currently aren't, who enjoy having a public holiday. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, thanks so much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. The next deputant is Gary Rigas, followed by Dave Henry and Tammy Laporte. Good morning. Good morning, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about Toronto's holiday shopping bylaw. My name is Gary Rigas. I'm the Director of Government Relations for Retail Council of Canada. Retail Council of Canada is the voice of retail in Canada and represents more than 17,000 Ontario storefronts of all retail formats, including deport, department, specialty discount, independent stores, online merchants and general merchandise, grocery and pharmacy. Our membership represents over 70% of core retail sales in Canada. Uh, government will understand that due to changing lifestyles and work hours, significant segments of the population are demanding more flexibility in retail hours of operation. Further, there are many retail employees who observe different religious or cultural holidays than the standard ones or who require or appreciate the opportunity to earn holiday and or overtime pay. Lastly, for a significant number of our employees who choose to work part-time because of our other commitments, including education, child care or family care holidays may be among the limited list of days on which there are no conflicting commitments or for which other caregivers may be available within the, fam within the family unit. RCC and its members would applaud the elimination of the bylaw in a perfect world as retailers want to respond to customer preferences. Successful retailers are constantly tweaking their business practices to achieve the delicate balance between responding to customer demand while being financially responsible and realistic. Government decisions on increasing the potential hours of operation increase a retailer's ability to achieve this delicate balance by opening during days, including holidays that are best for his or her business. In providing this choice, some retailers will decide to open, while some may choose not to open for business. Regardless of the operational decisions made at the store level, retailers would appreciate the opportunity to make that choice based on what they feel is best for the business and their employees. RCC believes that the decision on whether or not retail outlets should be open for business should be at the discretion of the business owner without restrictions imposed by government. It, if government insists on having rules on whether or not retail outlets should be open for business, those rules should apply even-handedly and not discriminate based on merchant size, type, or product offering. Retailers should be allowed to determine their own hours of operation based on consumer demand and employee availability and interest. In the retail world, change is happening every day. Retailers must adapt to, rele to remain relevant. So too must the city change to be more attractive to have businesses investing in the city and for tourism to flourish. Currently, businesses such as restaurants and theaters can be open on holidays. A retail should also be allowed to be open to support the tourism experience. In today's environment, more people are visiting Toronto, especially with the favorable U.S. exchange rate. Retailers want to truly be open for business. It's interesting, in a recent newspaper article about uh, the taxi uh, licensing in, in Toronto, the statement was made, the regulation governing, for example, Uber aims to allow innovation in the marketplace without loss of public value that the city needs to protect. This approach was put in place to support different operating models. I find it interesting that the city won't use this approach with the holiday shopping bylaw. Instead, it is stuck in the past. RCC cannot support an approach that allows certain retailers to be open while forcing others to be closed. For these reasons, we support the elimination of this bylaw. 
This will allow the retail community to determine their own hours of operation on holidays in order to meet the anticipated consumer demand. This approach has been successfully used in the Western provinces, BC, Alberta and Saskatchewan, and there has not been any negative impact on economic activity in those jurisdictions. Help thought Toronto's approach on this issue as it is stuck in the past. Don't miss the opportunity for positive change. Thank you. Thank you. Is um, <coughs> Councillor Fletcher, you have a question for the deputy? Yes, I just Please checked with the chair, and he'd been quite clear about what this meeting is about. Are you aware it's only about prepared foods and how to determine prepared foods in our bylaw? I am aware of that. I'm also and aware it's how. It's not about any of the nine holidays being able to owe any, anything other than prepared foods. I understand that. But your deputation seemed to be talking about all nine holidays um, rather than just prepared food. Well, I, was I just also wanted to be understand that you, uh, it's quite narrow that council said we're leaving the stat halls and we have to determine how to approach uh, prepared foods. I appreciate that, council. Thank you. Thank you. It's just for, I'm not sure, Councillor Fletcher, if you were here when I made my remarks at the beginning, I was very clear that uh, the item that we're dealing with today, it doesn't deal with the broader issue of uh, holiday shopping overall. And I did ask deputants to please focus the remarks on the topic that's before us. Otherwise, those remarks will be out of order. So, and so those remarks will be out of order. So I was very clear at the very beginning. Having said that, any other questions? Deputant, is Vice Chair Kalichanis, please go ahead. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you for coming to make your deputation, sir. So let me, let me understand clearly, maybe I misunderstood. You're advocating for us to support allowing stores um, to open on stat holidays. In a perfect world, Councillor, we'd like the retailer to make, be able to make that decision. Sir, in a perfect world, I sit around the kitchen table at Christmas time and have dinner with my family. I hope that you would like those employees to do the same also. In, in this environment, uh, Councillor, you're able to do that and the employees are allowed to make the choice whether they want to, to work or not uh, based on the laws of, of the province under the Employment Standards Act, to the best um, of my understanding. In a perfect world, uh, employers will not be taking out on their employees if they refuse to go to work. However, in this world, I would say to you that if you don't go to work, you'll be marked by the employer and probably you know, encouraged to leave. Would that be incorrect? I, I think, Councillor, that in many cases, uh, we've found that employees are, are, are grateful for the opportunity to in, uh, earn additional money to be able to apply to the various factors that they have to, uh, to provide for. Um, it's, a, it's a voluntary thing. No one's forced to work, as, as, as I understand it. Uh, so if the employer ca calls through the chair to you and says, uh, I'd like for you to come out to work on, on Christmas Day or Thanksgiving Day, and the employee says, well, I don't think I want because I want to spend time with my family. In a perfect world, do you think that that employer will be very happy with that employee? I, 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 the employer knows that the employee is protected under the Employment Standards Act and has the ability to refuse that work. True enough, uh, through the chair, but how many employers do you think will be very happy? It's a, it's a voluntary kind of request and there are other people in the, in the, in the employee pool that might relish the opportunity, Councillor. Through the chair to the deputy and, and really appreciate your thoughts, sir. How many employees when the employer calls and says, I want you to come to work, although begrudgingly you think they will say no, knowing full well that if they don't go, that they could be facing employer discipline or employer, let's say, um, be ostracized. Uh, I, I'm not aware of those situations, Councillor, to be fair. So you're not aware through the chair that if an employee refuses to go, they will be marked you're not aware of any situation like that? No, our, our members want to comply with the laws of the land. So you're, through the chair, your members will not take it out on the employees? Oscar I, th I believe that he has answered that question yet. That's what I'm hearing, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, appreciate that. 
Thank you. It's uh, Councillor Side. Please go ahead. Thank you. Mine's a very straightforward question. We heard about the, this perfect world, and we heard about Christmas, um, which I believe is actually a Christian holiday. Um, is your workforce all Christian? Our workforce is uh, identical to, and mirrors what the population uh, exists. In so there could be people that would not necessarily even celebrate some of these holidays. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bernstein. Very straightforward one. Any other questions? Thanks so much for your presentation. You. Next deputant is uh, Deb Henry. From, uh, um, good morning. Uniform I would like to policies. ask if um, the president of our local, Gord Curry, could speak. Um, he's up number seven. If the two of us could just swap our speaking positions. Is, if uh, members of the committee, I think that's, that's, in, that's in order, that would be okay. Thank you. So you'll make a joint uh, presentation? Oh, okay, okay, that's fine. Mr. Curry, please go ahead. Yeah, good morning, uh, Councillor City Staff. My name is Gord Curry. I'm the president of uh, Local 414 Unifor. Sitting beside me is uh, Tony Falcone. He's the vice president of uh, Unifor Local 414. Is that time going already? Our local union represents 13,000 workers, mostly in the retail and service sectors all across eastern and southern Ontario. Our members work in retail supermarkets, pharmacies, as well as food service, warehousing, and other service-related industries. About two-thirds of our members work in the Greater Toronto Area, including under Metro and Loblaws family of stores. I thank you for the opportunity to speak here today on the staff report and recommendations regarding Chapter 510 and its prepared meals exemption. As you can imagine, this is an important issue that touches the lives of tens of thousands of workers in the city. I can tell you that 4,000 uniform members are directly impacted by any change made to Chapter 510 rules. This is a bylaw that ensures these workers receive much needed time off the job, time to spend with family, time for some guaranteed rest on nine identified days of the year. As you can imagine, it's difficult to plan a life when work schedules fluctuate, fluctuate from week to week, or no set work hours and when pay is well below average. That's the reality for retail workers. That's why our union spoke out strongly in opposition to a 2012 city proposal to weaken these protections. That's also why our union spoke out strongly in opposition to a new set of proposals that would have gutted the bylaw earlier this year. And that's why we're speaking out again today. The staff report published on October 6 recommends that City Council expand the scope of the bylaw, allowing supermarkets and pharmacies that sell food to now open their doors on public holidays. That includes Christmas, New Year's, Labor Day, Thanksgiving. City staff has tabled two options on how to best do this. Unfortunately, neither of these options tabled are in line with the proposed uniform, proposal uniform and other city unions and worker advocates made. And that was simply to clarify the definition of prepared meals in the bylaw. Our proposal was to make clear what has been the historical application of the bylaw to allow restaurants to open but not grocery stores. It appears city staff disagrees. What perhaps most frustrating is the part of its rationale. City staff continues to suggest there has been some sort of transformation in the Toronto supermarkets. They suggest that a supermarket 20, 30 years ago never sold a prepared meal and that only today do stores sell barbecue, chicken, pizza and sushi. This is absolutely and completely false. I'll tell you what matters that a single mom might have to leave her kids with a babysitter on Christmas morning because she has to punch in for a shift to the store, or that a young worker has to cancel plans to visit a loved one on a long weekend because they are being told to put in a shift, or that a minimum wage worker might have to pony up cash to take a taxi into work because there's no other transit available. Not only do I think workers should have the right to rest and recharge on holidays, but I also worry that the rights of workers to fair pay and scheduling on holidays won't be properly enforced. Research in 2015 shows that public holiday infractions were among the top five most commonly reported in Ontario. During a special precarious work employment blitz, 
Nearly one quarter of violations involved holiday pay and scheduling. Just because there are laws on the books that protect workers doesn't mean they are enforced. Further extending these bylaw exemptions without a push for greater enforcement of laws would only leave vulnerable workers more vulnerable. We are not pleased with the options that have been tabled by city staff, but we are especially not pleased that of the two options the staff have recommended extend the bylaw exemption to include supermarkets and pharmacies, the more damaging of the two options. On behalf of the union and our members, I strongly urge this committee to change course. At the very least, we urge you to consider accepting option one in the report as the appropriate path forward. This option would steer clear of a full-scale expansion of store openings, would limit the exemption to those establishments that actually sell prepared meals, and would at least particularly preserve the bylaw's original integrity. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Bernstein, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, through you to the deputant. Um, so you have a concern that the city, uh, or I guess the province as well, because they uh, enforce a lot of the employment standards, but there's an issue with enforcement as it currently stands. Yes. Okay. So, um, and you're aware of the, the court case involving Longos? Yes. Okay. Um, so, as it currently stands, well, it's not, it's not workable, but there are, if you go into the Shoppers Drug Mart, there's certain areas that are roped off and certain areas that aren't, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, if we can't enforce, if we don't have the ability to enforce, um, what's the point of these rules? You do have the ability to enforce, obviously. So, so it's a, but you said we, we can't, we're not enforcing. So to, to put rules, extra rules in place, well, you, wait, I don't understand. Hey, Tony, you want to read that? So right now, as of 2015, uh, there were 17,000 employment standards claims filed with the, uh, with the Ministry of Labor about public holidays and, and uh, public uh, holiday pay. That's how many complaints there was. So at the end of the day, I guess council is going to have to make a, a decision on how they're going to handle this matter. And what we're looking at, in the perfect world, what our world is, is not to have the stores open. At all. Any stores. I'm sorry? Well, because there are, there are, as you know, there are certain, if you're under 2,400 square feet, you, right. can, you know, there are all these exemptions, right? So, okay. Um, and you mentioned that about prepared meals, and you made a fairly strong assertion about staff's interpretation or, or the information they provided. So I just want to clarify that. Are you saying that in the last 20 years that there haven't been an increase in offerings of prepared meals? There's been. You, you don't think there's been a change in the landscape? There, there has, but there's always been, uh, you know, going back 20, 25 years in, in these uh, stores. There's always been, you know, a snack bar of some sort where there was hot dogs, pizza, pop, chips, little stools to sit around there. So, I mean, there, there was meals. In some stores? Yes, yeah. Yeah, about 40 years they had the snack bars. In, in grocery stores, they had it. But that would be, a, and not to be argumentative, but that was more of a restaurant. I'm talking about uh, prepared meals in terms of takeout. Like sushi is, is a fair, you, you mentioned sushi, you mentioned, mentioned pizza. Yeah. From my experience in, shop, in grocery stores, like long goes with their pizza ovens. That's a fairly recent development. Uh, I would say no. Oh, okay, thanks. No. Thank you. Vice Chair Krejcianis. Thank you, Chair. In, um, in Ontario, we are the largest municipality outside our, our encatchment area. How is this being looked out by other municipalities about enforcing um, uh, people to work on those nine stat holidays? Do you have an idea of how many municipalities are enf forcing their, uh, their folks to do this or what other municipalities are doing? No, I wouldn't have any. To our, to our knowledge, we, we don't know any municipalities that are looking at this. So being the largest municipality, this would be, um, I guess, where people would be looking what we do as we move forward uh, and, and how we treat our um, employees, people that work at the supermarkets, the, the labor movement. Would I be correct in that? Yeah. 
Yeah, well, ha go ahead. If this were to happen, could your, could your union um, step forward and provide uh, daycare services for the people that have to work? Um, so if they have to leave their families, they at least will have somewhere to, to leave their kids. Uh, the Do you question, have that capability? No, we don't have that capability. What would happen is that our part-time eventually, what would happen is that they would be forced to work. And if there's part-timers, whether it's a single mom or a single dad, and uh, they would be, if, uh, if it was passed and the stores were open, what would happen is if they didn't show up to work, they would be disciplined. And after two, three holidays, they would be terminated. So we heard from a previous uh, depu deputant that there will be no uh, discipline taken out on, uh, on staff. Are you aware, uh, how many grievances have been filed because people have said, look, I've got to take this holiday. I mean, are, are we in that yeah. position yet? Yeah, we have thousands. And, and just to add to that, um, in, in our uh, local itself, I said we had 14,000 members. 70% of those uh, members are women. So 70% and, are... and so we would have lots of uh, single mothers in there with kids. So through, through the chair, and thank you for paying attention, Chair and, and, and colleagues. Um, how many single moms would you guess that you have from your local? In our we're, local, just and, and we're talking again down, we're about 4,000 members in the, uh, in the Toronto well, area. Let me rephrase itself. this question. How many from your 4,000 members that you have through the chair would be affected and they will have to work on those stats holidays? Oh, I, I'd say over half of them. Over 2,000? Yeah. Out of those 2,000 or your 50%, how many would you say have small children that they will have to make alternative means to leave them somewhere with a grandma, granddad, or, or a nanny because there's no daycare? Educated guests, I'd say half of that as well, maybe more. So we're looking at 1,000 people that would have one or two children, yeah. that probably about 1,500 kids that will have to be placed somewhere on Thanksgiving, on New Year's, on uh, Christmas holidays yeah. uh, because mom and dad would be probably, or mom will have to be called into work. Absolutely. How, how if, how, yeah, I'm blown away. Um, how, I mean, what have you heard from your members? What are these, these 1,500, I mean, 1,000 people saying? I mean, how is it gonna affect their lives? I mean, I know that at Christmas time, I have five kids and traditionally that we said to our children that Christmas, Thanksgiving, there's dinner and we would like you to be there. And although they're married, they, they go out of their way to make sure that they're there. How will that affect your, your members? And what signal will we be giving to the little ones when mom and dad cannot sit around Christmas time to have dinner with them on Thanksgiving? What signal will we be sending? It's absolutely the, the wrong message to send to our kids. And, and you said it, I mean, I'm 56 years old. Uh, don't let the, the hair, you know, trick you. I'm 56 years old. I have yet to miss a Christmas at my mom and dad's house and my daughter I have one daughter and she's with me all the time so it, it's not what you want uh, you know on these holidays is to to have your your son or daughter have to maybe go with one of your other relatives and sit there while you're at work it, that's not what you want you want the whole family together one of my colleagues said the Christmas is a uh, is a Christian holiday but this is not just the Christian holidays. There's the other holidays that are also affect your, your... Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Castro Nunciana, speaker. Okay, so I guess you don't have the stats on how many employees want to work and they can't work because they don't have, they, the, the hours are not there. Wouldn't, wouldn't have a stat, but uh, we're out there talking to our members and you'll hear from some of them and they, they don't want to work on these stats. And well, they, go ahead. Probably some employees out there that want to work. There could be. They need yep. the money. There could right? be. Yep. Now, do you have the stats on how many employees have been terminated? Because <clears throat> as you know, there's a lot of competition now with, uh, with retail and a lot of them are closing up in, in Toronto and they're relocating outside the city. They're going to Woodbridge and they're going to other yeah. 
uh, small municipalities to work. So what are the stats on the number of employees that have been terminated because the businesses have gone out of business? And, and I couldn't give you the stats, yeah. but I, I can tell you that, you know, in the, in the stores and that, there's a huge turnover in part-time. So a lot, a lot of these members, if they were being disciplined by that, might be walking away and, and go on to the next uh, supermarket, like you suggest, or anywhere else. But a lot of the businesses are closing up. You know, you realize that. So a lot of employees have been terminated because there's no jobs. But from our point of view, we're talking about grocery stores. We're not talking. I understand. Ta I understand. I our gross grocery stores that are closing up too. Well, from our from from our point, and uh, and we work for uh, we, we we work for Metro. Metro does not move stores because they, they move into the busy areas and our, our, our majority of our stores are in Toronto. Well, okay, that, that's it for my question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Any other questions? If not, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. We'll move to the next uh, deputant and that will be Tammy Laporte. Tammy Laporte, number five. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have you here. Thank you. You have five minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for letting me speak, Chairman, City Councilors, and staff. My name is Tammy Laporte, and I, I am employed by a grocery store for the past 19 years. I am a member of Unifor Local 414. I am also a single parent. Working in the grocery business is difficult. Wages are low and schedules change week to week. Some nights I work until 10 and I work at least three Saturdays a month. This makes precious time with my son extremely limited. One thing I can count on are my nine statutory holidays. These are days I don't have to stress about where I'm gonna find childcare. These are days that I know I'm going to have a full day of quality time with my family. These are days that I've worked hard all year for, and I have earned them. These are days that I'm not willing to give up. These are the days that you are assured to be sitting with your family, enjoying quality time, and I should be too. Over the past several months, I have spoken with many of my coworkers about the possibility of grocery stores being open 365 days a year, and the overwhelming response is in disagreement. None of us want to work. None of us believe that a grocery stores are that much of an essential service that we should have our doors open on holidays. All of us agree that we need our precious time with our families. We are well aware that there are rules to protect us and we have the right to refuse work on holidays. However, we are all aware of how many companies won't follow these rules. We will be coerced and bullied and many people who either don't know their rights or are too afraid of retaliation won't speak up and they are the ones who will be stuck working against their will. Those are the most vulnerable workers, the new Canadians, the workers who will be threatened with our losses in the future if they don't work holidays the young workers who have not yet found their voice to speak up against their employer. These are the workers that we need to protect the most. To keep a grocery store open on a holiday, many employees will be affected. You will need employees to prepare the fresh foods in all the fresh departments, butchers, bakers, employees to serve the customers, stockers, cashiers, customer service people, as well as management. It's not like a pizza shop or a small restaurant where a couple people are affected. We are talking many workers in every store. The bylaw should remain for its intended purpose to allow restaurants and convenience stores and essential pharmacy services to be open. I know many of you are thinking it's only nine days. You're right, it is only nine days, not nearly enough for our families. Only nine days that we can get together through our hectic lives and work schedules. Only nine days that some people get to be with their loved ones. We have lost sun Sunday dinners, Sunday family days for seven day work weeks for us, the precarious workers. And now we are in jeopardy of losing our only nine days for 365 days a year grocery shopping. I wholeheartedly believe this is going to affect many families who already have lost so much precious time. Thank you for listening to me. I hope you heard me 
and please ensure my co-workers and I keep our nine statutory holidays and ensure some quality family time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. We have a few questions from uh, members of council. I'll start with uh, Councillor Ethan Shan. You're first, please. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. You. Um, so on your regular schedule in a month, do you work on weekends and how often do you work on weekends? You mentioned something about you working on Saturdays, right? So. Um, yes, sir. I am covered under a, a union contract. So in my contract, I get one Saturday and four. And um, sometimes they will rotate it. Um, either Saturday, Sunday, or Sunday, Monday, and it's supposed to be equal. So six Saturdays off a year, sir. Oh, six, so it's already six Saturdays in a year. Yes, you would sir. be missing time with your family uh, and many, many no, people. No, pardon me, I work, I only get six Saturdays a year off. I only get six Saturdays a year yes, off. Yes, sir. And you missing all the other six, six, all the other Saturdays in a year yes, from sir. your families. Yes, sir. And, and you are in a unionized workplace. Yes, sir. And many people who are not in unionized workplace might be missing much more of yes, their weekends. Yes, they are. Okay. And, and there is an, there is, generally there's been some, some conversation about people having choice. As somebody, say if you have, you or either a coworker has family, uh, young family, would you be able to say I cannot work weekends and be able to be accepted as a, as a norm? Absolutely not. Okay, so, so in situations like that, um, you feel um, the choice is not there? No, the choice is not there. And um, the, the companies want people to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They want. And if you're one of those uh, employees who request certain days for family time for weekends, how would you be perceived by the employer? Um, again, our contract does cover if a part-time person, for instance, I have 19 years seniority, so um, a newer part-time person, if they were to request the odd Saturday off, they should not lose hours. However, if more than one person books it off, or there's a lot of other, and that's in a union, so what do you, on, on, on so many of those Saturdays, what do you miss out that many other families who work Monday to Friday get on a Saturday that from, from your family? Um, well, I can't take my son to swimming lessons and I can't take him, you know, we can't do anything on a Saturday. I get home at 5, 5.30. There's not much time left. And so these nine days help you at least to catch up with your family time? Absolutely. If, if, there are, if there are people who are not happy or if they feel like they are forced into doing something, um, where do they go? And do they often go to uh, get legal support or do they, are they able to access support to feel if they've been forced into a schedule? No, I think a lot of people are afraid. They're afraid to speak against their, their managers. They know they control the schedule, especially in, in non-unionized I have many friends who work in the grocery industry. What's the fear coming from? What, what do they think that will happen to them if they? Um, hour losses, shift changes, maybe they'll be working till 11, 12 o'clock every night instead of working day shifts. And you, you know, they can, they can do what they want. And many of those things could happen without giving you a reason why it's happening? Absolutely. The business has changed is what their reasoning will be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shan. Councillor Fletcher, you're next. Thank Please go you ahead. For, uh, thank you, Tammy, for coming today thank you. and telling us why uh, those nine holidays a year are so important to you and your family. Um, last, uh, in April, City Council voted to maintain the nine holidays. But what we have to grapple with is the courts told us that we have to make provision for prepared foods. And I'm wondering, uh, so prepared foods in uh, any setting, so somebody can buy them on a holiday. Would you, um, in that case, looking at your grocery store, would you want us to make sure that that's all that could be sold that day. That it wouldn't mean that the whole store could open up, but it would just be the uh, rotisserie chicken, whatever it is right there that's been prepared for someone to take home and eat right away. Well, I think to control that, I think that would be impossible to control. 
Um, in a pharmacy, I know somebody mentioned Shoppers Drug Mart, you can rope off that area. A grocery store, you got fresh salads over here, which by the way, I prepare. So I would still be affected in the prepared foods if it was prepared foods. Um, the delis over here, would bakery products be considered fresh foods? There's no way to rope off the, the eggs and milk and, and just have whole chickens and pizza. I, I, I don't believe there's a way that a, a large grocery store could, could accommodate that. But if we would have to, then that's what would have to happen. By law, if we were required by law to say prepared foods like the pizza slice, mm -hmm. like the rotisserie chicken, like the pasta salad that's been prepared or the Thai soup, obviously, you know I eat. <laughs> um, then we would have the option of just making sure only those prepared foods are for sale or the entire store could be open. Are you telling us we have to make be sure that we don't open up the whole store in order to sell a couple of prepared foods? Yes, I believe the whole store should be closed. Except for what we would, by law, have to keep open. Yes. If it was that we legally was would law, have to yeah. keep open. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Vice Chair Kajanis, you're next. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you to the deputy, and thank you very much for coming to make your deputation. How many children? Is it one boy that you I have? Okay. Yes, one son. How, how old is he? He's 11. He's 11. How important is it to him that you spend quality time with him, especially on Thanksgiving, um, on New Year's, on Christmas Day. Uh, family Day. Family, well, family. family's not part, of, it's not part of the night, but I'm talking about the nine, the nine holidays. How important is it to him? It's very important to him. Um, we always do something. Uh, you know, we go for walks, we go to the park, we visit family. Uh, we, it's very important to him. If you uh, wanted, if we say that, okay, those, those nine days, we're going to get you to work, and you wanted to, to bid, I think this is what it's called, to bid so you don't have to, to go to work to spend with him, uh, what are your chances of getting those nine days if you were to bid, since you're, you're a mom, to get those days off if we force you to, to, to work those nine days? Pardon me. I'm sorry. I just okay. didn't hear. Chair, can you put my time on hold, please? The, the deputy cannot hear. Is it is tough. Can we please just keep it just a little quiet? Sorry, Councillor, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. It's very important that we have that we allow the deputy to hear what we have to say, and I'm sure that uh, the Chair will certainly, not only the Chair, but the, the Speaker will agree with me. How important is it for you to spend this time with your family? And if we were to force you to go to work, would you be able to ask your employer to have those days off? Would you be able to bid in order to have those days off? And how successful will you be? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Um, I do have seniority. So for myself, possibly, I could get some of them off. For my, my coworkers who are in the exact same situation as me, no, they, they can't give the whole store off. That would defeat If you were to say no, I'm not coming into work today because it's a holiday. We heard from a previous deputy that you have that right to say no. Mm -hmm. What would your employer do? What result, I mean, what ramification would you have? What results would you have? Would you be disciplined? Um, I don't think they would refer to it as discipline. They would refer to it as the business is changing, your hours will change, your schedule will be more chaotic than it already is. So if you got a normal schedule, they will go out of their way to, let's say, to make your life miserable. Yes. You will be targeted, by other words. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, thank you for your, thank you. your deputation. Thank you. The next deputant is Kim Mullen. Good morning, good to have you here. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm a lawyer representing Iqbal Halal Foods, which is also known as Iqbal Foods. 
Iqbal Foods supports the recommendation in the staff report. In particular, Iqbal Foods supports staff's recommendation of the second option, namely that the prepared meal exemption be expanded to permit stores that primarily sell food to be open on public holidays. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my client's store. Iqbal Foods is an independent, owner-operated food store with one location in the Thorncliffe Park neighborhood where it has operated since 1991. It's a unique store in that it caters to the dietary, ceremonial, and religious needs of a number of South Asian communities, Muslims, Sikhs, Hindus, and other religions. These communities rely on Iqbal Foods to serve their day-to-day -day dietary, religious, and ceremonial needs, as well as special needs associated with events such as births, weddings, and funerals, where their religions prescribe certain food and other types of requirements. It serves customers not only from Toronto, but from all over the GTA, as well as the United States. Customers travel from places as far as Sarnia, Ottawa, Sudbury, and Cleveland to buy items that aren't available in their own towns. Often the religious holidays and life events that are celebrated by Iqbal Foods customers fall on or near days when this <coughs> the city's bylaw requires stores to be closed. For example, in tw 2013, Eid, a two-day religious festival, fell just after Thanksgiving Day. And on those days, Iqbal Foods customers often require special foods and special other services. For example, one, one such service that Iqbal Foods requires is the preparation of animals for ritual sacrifice. That's something that's required by a number of religions. If the store is closed, they can't access that service. I'm sorry, someone's cell phone is ringing. <laughs> so this causes hardship for Iqbal Foods and for its customers. And in addition, a number of the holidays on which the bylaw requires stores to be closed reflect Christian religious holidays and Christian values. Not only does this fail to reflect the diversity of Toronto, it also raises serious human rights issues regarding accommodation of religious and cultural differences. Iqbal Foods has been seeking relief from the bylaw since 2013 and has been raising these concerns, in particular the human rights concerns, since 2014. We have raised these issues before the Economic Development Committee, before council, with individual members of council, and with staff in the licensing department. And frankly, the city has failed to grapple with these issues or even to consider them. The staff report is the first sign of progress that Iqbal Foods has seen. While the recommendation in the staff report also does not specifically address the cultural diversity issues that we've raised, it does at least provide a solution for Iqbal Foods and its customers. And therefore, I recommend and urge you to adopt the second recommendation in the report, namely to allow stores that primarily sell food to be open on holidays. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few questions from you, visiting members of council. We'll start with Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Fletcher, you have any. The, the staff recommendation actually is to seek direction. Would you agree with me? It is, but it provides two options. Through you, Mr. Chair, it is to seek direction, but it does provide two options. The first one, simply to clarify the prepared meals exemption, and then the second, to permit stores that primarily sell food to be open on holidays. So primarily sell food would mean yours plus all the large supermarkets. In other words, would. they would be open. And you agree with me that option number one basically says that the city uh, has to look at accommodating prepared foods, but we shouldn't expand it for the whole store. Would, that is you're a option. lawyer, so I'm asking you if that really is what number one says to you. Option one does say that the option is to define prepared foods and exempt stores that sell prepared foods. Well, we have to, we have to live by, because of the court case, yes. The city has to determine how we're going to approach and deal with prepared foods. Would right. you agree with me? I with agree that? with that, yes. And we have a couple of options. Mm -hmm. One is to simply say, well, if you've got prepared foods in your store, keep the whole store open, which is what your suggestion is. 
Actually, just to be clear, there, there are two options in the staff report, and the first one is to expand the prepared meals exemption to permit stores that primarily sell prepared feel, meals to be open on public holidays. The section, second option is to permit stores that primarily sell food, so not just prepared meals, to so be open on holidays. What I'm trying to get at is the city has to deal with, by law, because we lost our appeal, we have to now have an approach to prepared foods. That's right. We could have an approach that says, okay, the entire store is open, or we could have an approach that says, okay, just your prepared foods area is open. Yes. Do you agree? That we I have agree. really two options, and there's no recommendation. The committee and council are going to have to decide which way we want to go. I agree. So if, just to establish those ground rules, we don't have a staff recommendation here. We have some options to deal with our problem of prepared foods and that in, the council has turned down having uh, the right simply to open on a statutory holiday. Uh, in April, I believe, we turned that down. Yes, and my client did make a submission and raise these issues and they were not addressed. Right. So we turned, council has been very clear, you would agree with me, city council, on maintaining stat holidays, the nine statutory holidays in our city. The nine statutory holidays, those holidays are we didn't make them up. They're provincial statutory holidays. They are provincial statutory holidays, but the City of Toronto is the only municipality in Ontario that is exempt from the Retail Business Holidays Act bylaw, so it does have the ability to craft its own bylaw. Right, <clears throat> and we have the City of Toronto Act, so we have to, and prepared foods, we have to determine how we're going to approach prepared foods. But the statutory holidays, you would agree, we didn't make them up. They're not City of Toronto holidays. They're Province of Ontario. Here's the nine days that we're saying our statutory holidays, and now we have to deal with this prepared foods problem that we have. But you would agree that around the nine holidays in April, City Council said, we support workers having nine statutory holidays, and that stores, if they don't meet the 24, you know, how many square footage, et cetera, that they're supposed to be closed. I agree that council made, made that decision, yes. And we've, that's about the third time we've had to make that. And so what we're really dealing today, we're looking at since uh, we lost the court case on prepared foods, we need to figure out how we're going to approach that, whether it's wide open or fairly restrictive. Right. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that we're talking the same language here today. We are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Pletcher. Is Councillor Shan, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted some clarification around the cultural aspect of, uh, of the holidays that you were trying to um, shed some light on. You were saying that the, the, the holidays are predominantly or mostly Christian-based, and that was a concern. Can you explain why that is a concern? Why is it a concern? Well, they're not predominantly. I would acknowledge that not all of the holidays are Christian-based, but there are three that are explicitly religious holidays, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, and Christmas Day. Those are explicitly Christian religious holidays. Also, New Year's Day is a day that is a holiday that is not, well, New Year's Day in different cultures and different religions is, is different. And also Thanksgiving Day is a day that's often not celebrated by people of different cultures. Good for, and because, the reason why it's a, problem is because it reflects a particular religion. So would you, what the concern is that the, the holidays that are reflective of other communities aren't holidays or the concern is that these holidays should be functional days? The concern is that people who don't observe those holidays are required to, in the case of my client, to close on those holidays and that people, and in the case of his customers, are prevented from accessing foods and other things that they need, as, and often in situations where it's on or about the time that they need things for special life events or their own religious holidays. So for example, you mentioned certain communities that Iqbal Foods serves, uh, certain religious communities. Does Iqbal Foods close on those days uh, that those communities have those festivals? Not necessarily. And they have the option to close on those days? They do. And they don't close on those days? Sometimes he does close on those days. And, but it's other days on those holidays even though their communities might be celebrating on those days, they're still open on those days? Often because the community wants the store to be open. Okay, 
So, um, so who works at Iqbal? And generally, like um, the communities of you know, is is there on on the days of the holidays? Are there? Um, it's the same days as the children might be. So, how, what impact do you see on the workers if the if the if the store was to be open? On the holidays, on the, on the, the nine Iowa? days, yeah. Um, the workers, my understanding is that the workers who work at the store mostly work in the neighbor, live in the neighborhood, in the Thorncliffe Park neighborhood, and so they are often able and usually do walk to work. Okay. So the transit issue isn't an issue. And as far as childcare, um, I think some of them would be in the same boat as other, as other employees, and some of them would have other options, family or other options for looking after children. And if they, uh, because you are talking about a specific client, my question is a bit specific. So if they are, um, do they have, we, we, we had uh, previous repetents who said they get six Saturdays off in a year or something. Do you have policies where weekends are exempt for people or, or how does the schedule work? I'm not, I'm not aware of how the schedule works generally. Okay. Um, so the statutory holidays, I mean, in, in, in Thorncliffe, for example, most, not all, most of them do go to school. Um, in public schools, and the children would be off on the days of the nine holidays, whether we like it or not. Um, so you don't see any impact directly on the people who work on, on, in the store. Do you have an idea of how many people work there? I'm not sure of the numbers, but it's not a large store. I believe that there are less than 50 people. Okay. And so you don't, you don't really see a major impact in their childcare or in their, I don't their family? Know. I just don't know if there's an impact. Okay. All right, thank you. Great. Uh, now we have Ka and, um, and then okay, that's. I'm sorry. No, before you, I have Councillor Musiala. Actually, a few of the questions were answered uh, as far as the employees. So right now, is your is your client? Um, uh, how many days a week are they open? Your client. Right now, he's open seven days a week. Seven days a week, except on the holidays when he closes. So would your client be able to accommodate, as Councillor Fletcher uh, spoke on, on separating um, the store um, and providing I, that service and it wouldn't have an impact? I, I think he could. My, my concern is that the first, my concern with the first option that staff has recommended, which relates to stores that primarily sell prepared food, foods, is I'm not sure my client's store primarily sells prepared food. Um, and I don't know, I mean, if the city is going to provide direction that stores that sell prepared meals, but that rope off the rest of the store can open, that's one thing, but, um, you know, there's a risk issue there if, if he doesn't sell enough prepared meals. Yes, but would your client be able to do that? He would, yes. It would be able if, to do If that. he okay. understood that that would be effective, yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and Councillor Karichanis, uh, you're next. Thank you, uh, Chair. Through you to the Deputy. And how many stores does your um, Iqbal Food have? One store. One store. As I, as I said, it's a single owner-operated store in Thorncliffe Park. And how many employees? I, as I mentioned, I'm not sure of the exact number, but it's not a large store. I believe it's fewer than 50. And they're unionized? I'm not sure. They probably are, but I'm not sure. Sorry. Um, through the chair, you're representing him here today? Yes. As their lawyer? Yes. If they would be unionized, you'd be aware of it. Would that be incorrect? Uh, I, I don't do their labor work, so no, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm here to deal with this issue. Maybe you can get back to us. The other thing that I was going to ask is, you know, I, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. And thank you for coming well prepared. Councillor Kajanis. Come on, we know a little bit better. Let's be respectful of our public speakers. Any other questions? Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, and now we have, we'll go back to number four, Dave Henry. Thank you for coming, good to have you here. Please go ahead, five minutes. Thank you for having me. Good morning, council and committee. My name is Deb Henry. I've been a grocery store worker for 13 years and a member of Unifor Local 414. I have two children, six grandchildren. 
and my daughter, who is also a grocery store worker in the Fresh to Go department, which makes the chickens, pizzas, and sushi. She has three children, myself, my husband, and my mother, all live in the same home, trying to keep the family together. My family is the reason I'm here today to discuss the importance of family values and traditions. These large companies that already make multi-million dollars in profits every year feel they are losing out to the competition and could be making much larger profits if their grocery stores that sell these chickens, pizza, and sushi could stay open another nine days a year without consideration for their workers that are already stressed, overworked, underpaid, and lacking family time or just time to rest their mind, bodies, and souls. Growing up, some of my fondest memories are those holidays such as Christmas and the excitement of waking up in the morning and Christmas when all of the family could get together. I have tried to keep up these traditions but find it increasingly more difficult with this changing in times. My family gets together every, sun families, every Sunday for family dinner, which on occasion my daughter cannot be present for as she is working. When I was growing up, retail stores were closed on Sundays. We have already lost this day, which has become part of the regular work week, with no extra pay or the option whether to work or not. My household has eight family members, and finding time to get together is becoming increasingly more difficult. We work hard to, to get together and teach the kids the importance of family and spending time. We only have nine days a year that we can plan for family gatherings and events. And in the future, will our children be told they must wait to open their Christmas gifts until their mom gets home from work or do their Easter hunt in the dark because no one was home in the morning? I beg you to consider what the impact of allowing grocery stores to open 365 days a year will have on all of us and our families. I don't want my children growing up speaking of traditions like something their parents and grandparents had and something that was passed and lost because of money. This shouldn't be an issue of how much more profits these companies can make, but about trying to preserve our families and respect and concern for the precarious workers that are paramount in making the companies their profits. We need get to get back to a time when we work to live and not live to work. Thank you for your time and consideration on this important matter. Thank you. Please remember, uh, Councillor Fletcher, please go ahead. One, as someone has talked about the uh, difficulty in trying to find care, because schools, of course, are all closed on those days, and the daycares are closed on those days. I think that your industry is predominantly women workers, is it not? Yes, it is. Um, who, for whatever reasons, have most responsibility for kids. And you may have a number of single moms that work in the industry as well. So. Having the requirement to uh, have the whole stores open, uh, you're saying would be not only, would be very hard for maintaining your family time, which is important to you, would it also be difficult to find what you're going to do? You'd be scrambling to find out what Absolutely. you're going to do. Absolutely, and I'm finding as, as a grandparent, and you know, we are all getting old, we're finding that we are taking care of the children so these parents can get out and work. I know that's one of the reasons that we, you know, my daughter and her family live with us so we can help pick up the slack. Um, otherwise, she wouldn't be able to pick up the hours. And grandparents are becoming the caregivers. And that's not by choice, it's a necessity. So out of 10, how important is, are those days for you for your time you're connecting with your family? In this Ten and a half. Ten and a half. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Vice Chair Janice here next. Thank you. I uh, appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I might have missed it. You said you had a daughter I that a also daughter works and in, yeah. in the industry? Yeah, and she works in the Fresh to Go department, which would be if they do decide to uh, rope off the rest of the stores, she would still be obligated to work. She works in that department. And you yourself also are in the same industry? I am. So if it happens that uh, your daughter is working, uh, you know, those nine start holidays, you might be able to fill in as the grandmother f to look after the, the grandchildren. I'm not might, I would have no choice. Okay, supposedly you and her were both called at the same time to go to work. Where's the little, the little one gonna go then? Um, well, the three little ones, 
would uh, you live how what ages uh, my great my daughter's children are 10 12 and 14. okay where would they go what alternative measures would you uh, be able to find for them to be looked after i'm not sure i would have to say i mean possibly my 81 year old grandmother might out of necessity have to or um they're very young would they have to stay home on their own it's something i don't uh, really Chris, want to think about. On Christmas days, I have five daughters, and usually it was tradition that we open the Christmas present, and it's still carried, although they're, they're in their uh, 30s and uh, mid-20s right now. Do you also have that tradition that you open on Christmas days? Absolutely. Okay. Do you also have the tradition that you have Christmas lunch or uh, Christmas dinner? Absolutely. All right. I'm going to move from there, and I'm going to ask you, do you also have the tradition of having Thanksgiving lunch or dinner or every holiday every so, sunday you know we do the family dinner and then holidays it's the opportunity to have so people who can't at other times those days is important for you the 14 the 12 and the 10 year old grandchildren Absolutely. to meet with their mom their grandma and their great grandma the 81 year old and sit around the table and usually we see on tv we see families sit around the table and all that stuff and i'm sure that's very very important to your family as a grandmother to see your grandkids open their presents absolutely and if that it's doesn't happen since the beginning of time i i would hate to think that it becomes a past memory for them and if that doesn't happen they'll be very disappointed absolutely um if you don't go to work in those days if you're called by your your employer or and your daughter um what are the chances of you getting being disciplined or what are the chances of you let's say getting the the shifts that are um, it would absolutely affect uh, the future schedules. Maybe the next uh, week she would end up getting a late shift where she normally wouldn't, which of course would affect who's going to watch the kids because we have a set plan. And is that a means of the employer trying to get rid of you? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Burnside. Thank you. Just to follow up on that. So you are you are confirming that the employer has taken um, uh, punitive action. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what would you think that uh, restaurant workers, police officers, firefighters, uh, taxi drivers, people who work in Tim Hortons or Starbucks, what do you think? And that's just to name a few. Um, what do you think they do to um, be together on these holidays? Would or do you just assume that hundreds of thousands of families aren't? Um, I would say that they probably struggle with it horribly. I'm sure they don't get to spend time with their families. Um, it's not by choice. I'm sure that they're there. It is, it is their job and their employer is, is giving them no choice but to work. So I, I wouldn't want to be in that position. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? If not... Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. The next uh, deputant is uh, Christine Connor. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Please go ahead, five minutes. So my name is Christine Connor, and I work for Unifor National. My assignments with Unifor is the retail sector. Thank you for the opportunity to hear me speak today regarding Chapter 510 and its prepared meals exemption. In Toronto, like other cities, there are clear rules governing the retail business can operate on nine recognized statutory holidays in Ontario. These rules are found in the City of Toronto Municipal Code 510. The exemption says that the holiday shopping restrictions don't apply to retailers who sell prepared meals. In fact, this is exactly how the City of Toronto and the staff have interpreted this prepare meals language for decades. I'm not even going to follow this. I worked part-time for Metro for nine years before I finally got the opportunity to go full-time. I was the single mother. I worked three part-time jobs, juggling my schedules, and I looked forward to my nine stat days that I could spend with my two children. Now my two children have children, and I don't want to see them having to be forced to work on a stat day because of prepared meals. Um, my grandchildren 
I have six grandchildren. And I wouldn't want them, I was always raised to have the Sunday dinners as well, like Debbie. Um, and our holidays, we spent them together as well. I don't want to see my grandchildren being forced to, or my son or my daughter, to search for somewhere that's opened that can take care of them. My, they, they live in Stony Creek, I live in Barrie, so I mean, grandma would probably come to the rescue. But then it, it, it's just more stress for, for the younger families. When I worked part-time and I had my three jobs, those stat holidays were the world because that was my time with my children that I knew nobody could take away. Now it's, it's uh, I believe uh, it was Councillor Caraganis that said this morning about uh, the TTC and how would they get to work, how would you? Get, get, get to work on the holidays. It, it's holiday service, so it's instead of a, a six hour shift or a seven hour shift, you're going to an eight hour or a 10 hour and, and looking for daycare. I hear over and over again that it's voluntary. It's not voluntary in the stores, it's voluntold. And if you don't, there are repercussions on the scheduling the next week. We have all, you can check your whole back room here, we've all encountered that and, and for me that's going back 15 years as we understand that prepared foods is prepared foods and we have to do something um, I would like you to consider restricting it as much as possible not to allow the full premise open and if it's roped off in a certain area I think that we could probably work something that, that that would work that way if it's just that area, not the full store. Thank you for your time. Deputy Mayor, Deputy Mayor uh, uh, Linda Beermaker. Thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for coming in today. Uh, I I don't know if you, and you don't have to if you don't want to, of course, but did you say the name of your employer or where you've been working? I worked at Metro. Metro. So I'll just use that store, a similar type of grocery store. That's where I shop down at Markham and Eglinton. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if on a holiday at Markham and Eglinton I was to go in there, and I know that, again, we all know the stores very well, I'll call it, there's a portion when you first walk in the door that sells the chicken and the pizza and sushi. Fresh to go. Yep, all yeah. of that stuff. <laughs> um, you're saying to us that even if the law and the courts say that that portion of the metro should open, that the people who are selling flowers at the opposite end of the store, or I guess there's the frozen food aisle and the ice cream and the dairy and all of that other stuff, uh, including light bulbs and laundry detergent and cat treats and cat grass that I buy, all of that stuff you're saying, your preference would be to say, well, if some people have to, to work, restricted to that, say 10% of the store, why should the 90% of us be required to work or requested to work when it's a small area. Do you think the store could actually operate like that? Or no. would want to operate? I mean, you're, you're speculating, I know, but. No, I, I don't think that they would, but if you have to do something around prepared meals, then you're giving them the option that if they want to rope off that certain part of the premise, because the whole store is not prepared meals, like a restaurant. It would be that certain section. So if you allow to have that certain area roped off, you're telling me that it would be voluntary. So if they could get the volunteers to work it, then they could open it. If they can't, then they won't. Right. And again, just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to assume that the flower department, let's assume they just have one full-time person working there during, during the day. So again, you're saying that say if it's you, uh, you really just, you, you really don't want to sell flowers on a statutory holiday. I would say no. You want to be, you want to be at home. Yes. And if uh, there's, I'm going to call it a skeleton staff, or there's a smaller staff down at the other end of the store, you're saying, well, people will draw lots, or there may be volunteers, there might, might be some people who do want to come in, others who don't, but some, somehow if we have to do that, which Im impinges on your ability to take a vacation, just do it that portion, not the rest. That would be your preference. 
That would be my preference. Okay. My, my guess is if you owned a metro or whoever owns metros would say, well, we want the whole store open because then we could sell lots more flowers too. Of course they would. And more like I can give you one example. Um, I was previously the president of Local 414 for 14 years. Um, we had a store in Chatham and their bylaws, they could open on, I believe it was Thanksgiving. And my phone was ringing off the wall three, three weeks before Thanksgiving from that store. And the members were, they want volunteers, they want to open on Thanksgiving, we're not working Thanksgiving, it's all. I said, then don't volunteer. I said, if nobody volunteers, they can't open. And nobody volunteered and that store did not open. And to this day, that store has not opened on Thanksgiving. Okay. And through you, Mr. Chair, in, in terms of, I'll call it the, the reality on the ground, because in theory we all have rights not to work, but when I was uh, in my teenage years and in my 20s working in retail and first at Mother's Pizza and at the Hudson's Bay and all of those places, I, I certainly observed that people who the management didn't like suddenly got really short shifts. I think they the minimum we were allowed to work was three hours. So suddenly, if they decided they didn't like you or me, suddenly you would get five three-hour shifts. And I would say, well, you know, it takes me over an hour. I live in Scarborough. We don't have a subway. Uh, it takes me an hour just to get to work. <laughs> or, Put that in there. <laughs> so it takes, takes, me, takes me an hour just to get to work. I work three hours. takes me an hour to get home. I'm really not, I'm not even really making minimum wage. It's so it, there would be a, a push out the door, not maybe an outright firing, but certain things they would do just It would make it very grief. difficult. So do, do, now that, now I worked there in my 20s. That uh, was three decades ago. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, has changed. <laughs> okay, I was gonna ask you. So today, and I'm seeing people behind you that are currently working all in, in some of the grocery stores and retail, that can still happen. You're afraid. So even though technically an employer might say, well, we didn't do anything against you. Mm -hmm. you could, well, you know what you, well, actually what you did is you changed my shifts. And they said, well, it's, it was a slow month. Geared to the business. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Chair. Through you to uh, the diplomat. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I might not have been paying attention. How many children? Are in, in, are in the family? I have two children. They're Ages, grown please. adults now. They're okay. 30 and 35, and I have six grandchildren. Six grandchildren. Um, did you, do, do you get to spend time with the grandkids at Christmas time, Thanksgiving, um, the um, Labor Day, uh, I mean, you know, Labor Day weekend that we all come down to march with, with the unions? Do you get to spend time with the kids? Those are my days with my babies. So it's important for you to spend not only the Christmas and Thanksgiving around the Christmas table, the Thanksgiving table, but also to spend the weekends where you can, you know, on, on long weekends in the summertime that you can enjoy the kids at the cottage or in the lake or even in, or take them down at the, the parade at the Labor, uh, you know, Labor Day weekend. Was that important to you? Very, very important. Um, if you're, I'm not sure if your daughter works for, for any of the stores, but. Oh, no, she doesn't. She doesn't. Probably mom's advice. Um, <laughs> it was. <laughs> How long will it take you to get to work on a on a on a on a, on a, on a weekend, which is you know TTC is running a, a holiday schedule? When I worked in the stores, um, I did not have a vehicle. I was a, a single mom, and I would have to take the bus. And when they implemented the Sunday shopping back in the day, it was uh, Sunday hours on the bus. It wasn't holiday shopping; it was Sunday mm -hmm. hours, and it would take me an extra forty-five minutes to get to work. So, so altogether, how long? Well, 45 minutes there, 45 minutes home, and then whatever shift. So it's an hour and a half extra that you didn't get to, you don't, you will not get to spend with the grandchildren. Yes. Um, the the stores that brought the action, I believe it was Longos, would I be correct? Yes. Are they open? I mean, now that they... Well, we looked into it, and this Thanksgiving that just passed, they were not open. They, they were, were not open. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> how important is it, how many, how many of your union members that in your local um, are people that have kids and single moms, well, roughly? I, I do belong to Local 414, so it would be the same figures that uh, Brother Curry gave earlier. Uh, I believe it was 4,000, and it, it would affect roughly 50%, so another 2,000. Okay, so we will have thousands of kids not having their parents 
forget the Christmas and, and Thanksgiving because to one of my colleagues, these are Christian holidays and may not be important, but the summer holidays, the Labor Day weekend, the uh, Simcoe Day weekend, the Victoria Day weekend. So you wouldn't be able to spend those days with grandkids and kids. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Bernstein. Thank you. Um, would you agree that for better or worse, the traditional work week has changed over, over time? For, most, for, for many people, if not all. Yeah. 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 I would agree it's for worse, don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, but would you, um, what would you say, we heard, we heard the, uh, a lawyer from Iqbal Foods in Thorncliffe, an area that I represent, um, and just f for your edification, Thorncliffe is a, um, many newer Canadians, uh, different religions, uh, many people are, have their own small businesses or a lot of them drive taxi cabs, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there is a, um, a demand for Iqbal Foods to be opened on these holidays. Um, and given that some of these holidays, if, if not all, to um, Councillor Kerry Janice's point, some of them are religious holidays. What would you say to, to the community, that community specifically, that wants Iqbal Foods to be, to be open and to be able to, um, to, pay, uh, to go there, to I shop there? I would say there? you have 356 days a year that you can go and get your groceries and what you need, and you would have things available to you and to leave the nine stat days alone. And if they're talking about religious holidays and whatever, and they don't celebrate them, so they should be allowed to open. No, it's always been that way. If we want, maybe we should discuss adding more. So we shouldn't holidays. make accommodation for, for others who may have a different um, schedule and way of life. Oh, okay, that, that's fine. Um, we can add in more holidays. We'll gladly take more stat days. So you would say add, add more stat days, but then allow them to work? Because adding more no, stat days I just makes it more of a problem for them. No. What I'm saying is we have our nine stat days, leave our nine stat days. There are um, different communities, religions, religious beliefs that celebrate different holidays than we as Canadians do. So nine days to me is not enough. So if we want to add more, we'll add more. They can enjoy our Christmas and we can enjoy their Christmas. We'll take a few but if they days. So, but if they add an, say you add an extra day for Christmas, okay. so they could be open Christmas, but not, no. but. No, because they're still going to celebrate our Christmas because they do now. Okay, uh, I'm not following, but that's fine. I'll, I'll move on. So, what do you say to the back to the TTC driver, the cab driver, the the person that works at Tim Hortons? Uh, you know, the list goes on of people who actually work on these days. The restaurant worker. Uh, what do you say to all those people who don't necessarily have uh, and that stat day? They actually work. Well, like Debbie, I wouldn't want to be in that situation. Um, I would say that maybe we should have some town hall meetings and talk about not allowing them to work on the so day as well. I, I don't think that anybody should be working on the holidays, whether you work in a restaurant, whether you work in a gas station, I don't believe that anybody should. But society today, and with the language that's in 510, it's prepared meals. So that's what we're discussing is prepared meals. If you sell a prepared meal, what is the definition of a prepared meal? Right. So if you're going to have the fresh to go section and you want it sectioned off, okay, maybe we can have to live with that. But are people gonna work it or not? That's not up to me. That would be up to management and to the volunteers. I'm saying everything should be closed on the holidays. But that's the real world and it's not gonna happen. No, no, I was just trying to understand your position. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Bernside. And, uh, <laughs> and I wasn't on the chair and we missed at that point. Councillor Fletcher, please. I, Councilor I just Fletcher, have again. one question. I should have asked it earlier. I'm gonna ask everybody. Um, the statutory holidays, those aren't given by your employer. They're not statutory holidays of the city of Toronto. They're not statutory holidays of a certain, given by a church. They're statutory holidays governed by 
the laws of the province of Ontario. Would you agree with that interpretation? Yes. So it's not up to you or me or anybody else to add or subtract. It's the province of Ontario, if they wish to take away some that are statutory or add new statutory holidays, then they have that ability. Correct. <laughs> so when really what we're looking at is whether or not the City of Toronto, the councillors at the City of Toronto, will support um, people who uh, work in large non-essential industries. <clears throat> so you'd agree that the TTC has to keep running. Yes. People have to keep, uh, ambulances have to keep running. Police have to, there's certain services that are required on a stat holiday, right? I actually, I had a conversation, one of my best friends is a 911 dispatch for Barrie Police Department. And I was talking to her about the prepared meals and opening stores in that 365 days a year. And she looked at me and she said, well, I have to work it. And I looked at her and I smiled and I said, and you were employed since you were 18 years old as a 911 dispatcher. I said, your job is life and death. I said, you make 40 something dollars an hour. I said, and if you work the holidays, you get the double time. I said, you're talking about precarious grocery store workers at minimum wage. And she looked at me, she says, oh, she goes, I never thought of that. And I said, Yes, so certain uh, certain jobs are required. Exactly. Um, but shopping at the bay might not be required. Exactly. Uh, getting your groceries 365 days a year, unless you're really poorly planned at shopping and need to do it every day, you can make do. Uh, and But those are provincial holidays. We're not making them up here. We just have to figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to apply it. And you would agree that, I guess it's since I met you, we've turned down um, the ability of all stores to open in the City of Toronto. The City Council has said no. Not every store can open over three times now. Yes. And to date, but we've got this little uh, leftover problem of prepared foods. Prepared and it, in dealing with it, we should keep restricted as much as possible. Much so as possible. we're not opening a Pandora's box so that every big store can open. Is Correct. that what I'm hearing you say? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Any other questions? Thank you for your presentation. We'll move to the next uh, deputant, Adriana Georgakopoulos, followed by Susan McMary. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have you here. And so we have a double, double deputation or? Fantastic, please go ahead. Uh, good morning. My name is Adriana Georgiakopoulos and I work for Loblaws. As a worker at a store, I'm a proud union member and an activist with UFCW Canada Local 1006A. Paul Doherty, a representative from my local union is also here with me today. As an activist, I am dedicated to fighting for justice and fairness for my fellow co-workers, as well as working people across Ontario and the city. Today, I stand before you in opposition of the proposed application to expand the prepared meals exemption beyond restaurants within the holiday shopping bylaw. Currently, out of 365 days per year, I'm entitled to nine statutory holidays. That is certainly not a lot, and frankly, I find it offensive that I have to stand before you in effort to ensure that I continue to enjoy those nine days. Believe it or not, I and my coworkers have a life outside of work and have family obligations and responsibilities. For most of these nine days mark special occasions where families have opportunities to relax and enjoy time with one another to unwind from their hectic work weeks. This proposal clearly benefits business and employers in the retail food industry. It allows them to continue to increase their profits at the expense of those of us who will be forced to work on these days. It is certainly does not take into consideration the added stress that workers will experience when they are forced to work. It is, it is not likely that we will see an increase in our wages. We certainly won't be seeing an increase in our hours and they'll just be spread out over 365 days instead of 356. Again, we are talking about just nine days. 
Is it really too much for us for that workers continue to enjoy what we currently have when there is no clear or ur urgent reason to take them away from us? How does this in any way, shape or form benefit the average worker? Is it really necessary for retailers to be open on the extra nine days only because they sell food or have a small section of prepared meals available, especially when it, has, it is at the expense of their em employees? I urge you to, con to seriously consider the communities and workers on the floor and not the increased profits for businesses. We are talking about just nine days. Surely that is not too much to ask for, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Questions? These three members of council? If not, Vice Chair Karjanis, go ahead. Good morning, and, and thank you for coming. And really want to thank the moral support to your my left, your right. I didn't catch if there was any, any children that you might have. Uh, no, I do not have any children. Okay. How important was it for you to spend uh, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Labor Day, um, uh, Victoria, Victoria Day, Simcoe Day with your parents uh, when you were growing up? Did you have an opportunity to sit around the Christmas table and, and be with them Thanksgiving? Yeah, and our extended family as well that have small children. I realize you're of the Greek Orthodox faith. I am. And my question to you is, if you want to take those days off as holidays, do you book them through your, to your employer and, and how accommodating they are? I would have to book them off and uh, the accommodation would be, I guess, um, if it was a busier day of the year and whatnot, then I may not um, get them. How accommodating have they been through the chair? Um, I would say probably about 50-50? 50-50. So if we were to force you to work those extra nine days and you say, I want to take my religious holidays, you will get 50-50, correct? Yeah. So it is important to you then as you go forward, probably family, children coming along, that you get to spend those days with, you, with your family. Absolutely. And it will also be important to you to be able to get those 50-50 on the other on the other holidays yeah. and you might not get mm -hmm. so i heard from my colleague talking about police officers and other religions and all that stuff and here you are in another religion and you don't get them so if we were allowed the employer to say okay open it up the chances of you getting not only the other religious holidays will be probably zero thank you very much appreciate it thank you any other questions if not, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Susan McMary. Good morning. Good morning. Um, apologies for the frog in my throat. If it starts riveting, I'll take a drink of water. Um, my name is Susan McMurray, and I'm executive assistant at the Toronto and York Region Labour Council. My name is Hashem. I am the uh, senior organizer for the Toronto York Region Labor Council. Welcome. Good to have you here. Thanks. Please go ahead. We represent 208,000 members in the Toronto area and are here today to talk about unionized and non-unionized workers facing the possibility of being forced to work on public holidays. Workers have struggled for years to acquire some control over their work hours, including pu uh, paid public holidays. Some of you may remember Bob Cratchit, the humble office clerk working for Ebenezer Scrooge in the famous story, The Christmas Carol. All Bob Cratchit asked for was a day off with pay to spend time with family at Christmas. And Scrooge responded that taking Christmas day off with pay is like picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. He saw paid public holidays as theft. Few would share that belief today, and yet, we find ourselves here today because the City of Toronto appears to be contemplating expanding the types of businesses that can stay open on public holidays, leading to the obvious conclusion that people will be needed to work on those holidays. In the recent consultations, according to the report that, uh, that we've read, most members of the public said there was no need to expand holiday shopping, and they described the negative impacts of doing so. Representatives of working people, the unions and, and others, were unanimous that there should be no expansion, respecting the need for a, a small handful of common days of rest for workers each year, most workers. 
The business community's input was mixed, with some saying don't expand at all, and others calling for a repeal of the entire bylaw so that shopping could be wide open everywhere all the time. We were asked during consultations about the impact of expanding holiday shopping. The workers provided lots of input about the impact of doing so. Apparently business did not, simply saying that they should be the last word on the subject. So you've heard this morning all the reasons for why not. Loss of a common day of rest. Many vulnerable workers would, uh, would likely face recrimination if they say no to their boss. Workers may not actually receive any premium for working on a public holiday, but may simply be given another day off instead, but not at a time when their families are also off. Challenges finding adequate childcare with little or no form uh, formal childcare being available on public holidays. And getting to work when the TTC is on holiday service with later subway openings, reduced service on some streetcar and bus routes, and no service at all on other routes. So the reasons for considering expansion are unclear, except that there's been a, a vague court decision. And as we heard, um, Longo's kept its two stores, which were the subject of the court case, closed on Thanksgiving. I don't think there's anybody who can tell us that business must remain open uh, nine days more a year in order to survive. I don't think we hear any clamor from Torontonians to shop on public holidays, and I, I haven't heard anyone here today saying they want to shop on uh, public holidays. And I'll remind you of the words of a Torontonian interviewed by City Pulse earlier this year, walking along Danforth on a public holiday that my, uh, my colleague spoke to you about in April. And this guy said, sure, I'd like to see stores open as long as I'm not the one working there. We invite you to review the Good Jobs for All Declaration to see the elements that make up a good job. Nowhere in that declaration does it say, give people the opportunity to work on public holidays. Nobody wants to work 365 days a year. And there are other policy mechanisms available to people for raising people's wages, other than working one more day a year. The Toronto and York Region Labour Council is opposed to any expansion of holiday shopping and does not believe it is a necessary response to the small problem presented by the Longos court case. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Uh, Councilor Mufenshan, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you, you mentioned the Labour Council represents over 200,000 um, um, workers. Where do workers uh, who are unionized in retail sector or in, co in commercial and grocery stores and so on fare in terms of precarity, in terms of challenges in terms of workplaces? Certainly the, the research that we've seen and as our brothers and sisters have talked about today, um, grocery store workers are um, among the precarious workers with part-time temporary hours, uh, the, the challenges of scheduling relatively low wages. Even in unionized setting? Even in unionized setting. So how does, uh, as, as a labor body that talks about workers' rights and, and advocates for it, how do the non-unionized workers fare in this situation? in retail and commercial? My, our assumption would be that, that they are uh, the same or worse off. Okay. Now, uh, I'm sure there's research on that, I just don't have it handy. Now the vulnerable uh, workers, when you talk about vulnerable workers in, in situations like this, who are they and what, what kind of demographics can you notice from your work? Uh, again, we've heard this morning a lot of women, um, people in lower wage jobs, um, tend to be from racialized communities, um, and I, I, I think that gives a pretty good example of who those workers are. Okay. So racialized young workers, women, um, would you from your experience say that accessing justice if they were mistreated or if they were intimidated or if they were um, harassed or if they were told that you know if you didn't do this, your schedule would be cut, how much access do they have to legal support uh, in, in Toronto? Well, from our, um, the unionized sector, we heard today that often there are no, um, uh, no, nothing in the collective agreement that would allow them to refuse that work. Uh, in the non-union sector, um, we've, we've uh, through the changing workplace review, which looked at precarious work, um, it has called for a big expansion of enforcement at the provincial level because so many precarious workers do not have their basic rights under the Employment Standards Act met. 
and that would include grocery store workers. If, um, if you were to look at uh, businesses, and have you, do you think any businesses or any workers in, in any of these sectors feel that without these nine days, their business needs to be closed? Or, I mean, they would lose, they would be in a situation that they'll have to close down their stores anyway. We haven't pulled business on that, but certainly, um, as I said in, in reviewing the consultation report, I didn't hear anything um, that said that businesses thought that their business would be at risk if they couldn't stay open, nor did the business representatives who I heard here this morning. What's usually the average pay for workers uh, who are in, in this situation, in, in unionized? The, the new minimum wage is 11.60 an hour, and it, it sounds as though that is the uh, the, the wage. Okay, it's close, close to that. So, economically, do you see an argument for workers wanting to work that extra day to get the money, or is it going to cost them more to find the childcare, find the transportation, find ways to be able to do that? Yeah, certainly, there people are going to incur costs uh, for working on those days. And there may be some uh, collective agreements that provide some premium for working on, on certain days. Uh, you'd have to ask the, our, our union brothers and sisters. But um, as I alluded to in the Employment Standards Act, um, workers, <coughs> pardon me, workers and their employers, if they agree, instead of getting premium pay for working on a public holiday, can agree that the worker will get another day off, um, subject, and I put in quotation marks, agreement between the worker and their employer, because again, if, if the employer wants to, you know, force them to accept that, that would be the, that would likely be the case. So not only is there no premium pay, but there may be additional costs that they're incurring. Thank you. Thank you. Is visiting members and um, Councilor Fletcher, please go Thank ahead. Thank you. Thank you. In uh, the staff report, the recommendation is to seek direction from Council about what to do about prepared foods. Would you agree with that? Yes. That's the recommendation. And then later on, there's a couple of options. One, basically, that would severely restrict. Um, one that would interpret prepared foods that said that's really all you're going to be able to sell. And the other would say, well, if you're selling prepared food, you might as well sell all food, just to put it simply. You'd agree that those are the two choices that are that our staff, our legal staff, our MLS staff have put before this committee and eventually council. Yes, I would. Do you see it in any other way? Is there any other way to interpret that? No. Nope that we have this issue around prepared foods because of these court cases. Yes. Yep. So somehow we have to grapple with how, as a city, we're going to interpret prepared foods on the nine statutory holidays that are provincial holidays that provinces said, everybody should have these days off except da 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 da, and now somehow we've got prepared foods added in there. So of those two options, which one are you suggesting that we consider for the, after you've, you've heard all of these people come today and talk about how difficult it is, well, how much they like to spend time with their family on these nine days, how important these nine days are to them, how they would have a hard time getting to work, how they don't know what they would do with their kids, and just again, that it's the one time they know they have to spend quality time. So what should, in, what's your advice to us in handling the prepared foods issue? Or should we simply ignore it? Or how should we handle it? So while it's a little bit of a Sophie's choice to choose between the two of them, um, because both of them appear to provide, a, uh, or even option one appears to provide a, a slight expansion, Labor Council would certainly prefer option one over option two. And if it's possible to say, uh, let's just, because we have to, now the courts have said within holiday shopping, City of Toronto, you have to provide for prepared foods to be sold on the nine stat holidays. What about if we had a bylaw that said 
that's all you can sell. Mm -hmm. can't I mean, sell every, you can't sell, as somebody said, the flowers, and you can't sell the this, and you can't sell the that. Yeah, and uh, in fact, um, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm an economist, um, whatever that says. The, one of the issues that I can see is that it, um, it appears that there is the belief that the uh, 510 duplicates the Retail Business Holidays Act. We know that the Retail Business Holidays Act doesn't apply, but the attempt in, in preparing 510 was to duplicate. There, the, the judge on the appeal in the Longo's case said that there was ambiguity around premises, let me Ambiguity, premises selling goods or services in the form of or in connection with prepared meals. In the staff report, I see quotation marks around selling goods or services, and I don't see the quotation marks around premises. So there's something a little different in the bylaw because it allows premises yes. selling prepared meals so to be I open. guess what I, I'm not asking you to be a lawyer here. Thank I'm you. saying this committee, this council has two options in front of it. One is to interpret prepared foods very narrowly. Say you can sell the rotisserie chicken, you can't sell the flowers. The other option is to say you can sell the rotisserie chicken, and by the way, since you're doing that, sell the flowers too. So what's your advice to this committee and to city council? To restrict it to the sale of prepared meals. Okay, thank you. Thank you, any other questions? Thank you. Um, you said you're an economist, and, and I'm going to take you up on, on ex exploring a, a few numbers. If a person wants to go and shop on Christmas Day and they're not able to, how much loss of business do you think the stores will, will have? I mean, they can always go back and shop another day. Yeah, so I'm not a retail analyst by any stretch of the imagination, but um, the amount of income that people have is is fixed. Uh, adding more days of shopping would give the appearance of simply um, spreading those people spending over a larger number of days. So whether you go shop on Christmas Day, or you wait another day and you, you go, uh, you know, the the on the 27th, it's still going to be the same. It's buying not going to change anything. Yeah. And your buying power is still your buying power. Exactly. So it will cost the store more to open versus any savings that they would incur. Like, I mean, I understand that we should open the, the food section because people might want to get food, but the rest of the store to open it, it will cost them more and paying the employees time and a half or sometimes double time, there will be no, there will be no, no savings that, I mean, no, no more income that they will have. There will be no cost benefit. Will I be incorrect in that? And, and who knows what the reasons are for which Longo's has decided not to open those two stores on, on public holidays. Perhaps it's that. Would you be surprised that if I was to, to tell you that Longo's did not open up because they did the number crunching and they figured that we're going to lose money here? It wouldn't surprise me. Okay. What would the, uh, the morale impact be on mothers, families, if they don't get to spend it on the religious holidays and the other holidays with them? I think we've heard that so eloquently described this morning. Would you be surprised that if I was to tell you that somebody that brought that idea up in this council, unfortunately, the, I can't mention if the gentleman is here or not because I'd be breaking the rules. Myself and my colleague here have brought a motion that we allow um, other denominations to have one or two days, and that person voted against it? You wouldn't be surprised. I'd, I'd leave it at that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Is, I do have a question, actually, for you in terms of the options and this uh, follow-up to Councillor Fletcher's uh, questions. And option number one, which um, the Labour Council, it seems like, uh, would prefer, it's um, that to be for prepared meals only and with some restrictions on the um, grocery stores. Now, my interpretation of recommendation number two is to sell foods, but with restrictive aspects to the 
to the Walmarts, the Costcos, and so on. So the, my question to you is in terms of the definition itself, because I think that the confusion, the, um, the, one of the reasons why the city ended up in court is because the nature of the definition wasn't clear enough. Mm -hmm. So if, if a motion was to be moved along those lines or the, in terms of clarity that could apply to either option, one or two, would you agree to it? Do you think that probably there is a need maybe for further clarification within even those two options? I'm just thinking about the definition per se. I don't know if you had a chance to magnify that aspect of the option, of the either option, one or two. Do you have any feedback on that, perhaps? It was a long question. Yeah, so, um, the, mm -hmm. so, so I, wasn't, the two I wasn't sure well. which, which kind of definition you were asking about. I'm sorry. And just to see clarification, are you, are you asking whether to restrict the definition of prepared foods, foods to include uh, other criteria that would um, necessitate this, the opening of grocery stores or partial pieces of grocery stores? Or are you saying that the prepared foods, because I think the court case, uh, the ambiguity around the court case and, and the reason why we've gone down this road is, as you so well said, is that prepared foods hasn't been properly defined. Um, and that because of that, like, that, the, the unclarity, um, that we are in this situation right now. So what we're saying, and our, and our position has always been, is that the clarity needs to come in order to fall in line with the principle of the of the of the of the bylaw, which is to ensure that premises like restaurants who are who are selling prepared foods, whose main purpose of business is to uh, the sale of prepared foods, be uh, the definition be restricted to ensure that those facilities remain open, and that which is what the original principle of this, of this bylaw was intended to create, uh, versus expanding it to something that would include any other premises of it. It's, um, yeah, that would be most likely the intent of that motion, perhaps, is to, in terms of the definition itself, and that would mean an establishment whose business is primarily selling food to the public, but does not include a retail mall with a food court, for example. So that will bring a further clarity to either option that may apply to one or two. Mm. So is my question to you is, do you think that there is a need for further clarification on either option, maybe to bring that kind of definition forward? That would really depend on what the def definition ends up looking like at the end. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, thanks so much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Next deputant, Anna, Anna Hudson, followed by Mary Leonard. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm Ms. Anna Walker. Hodgson. I am with Unifor Local 414. I'm a part-time cashier at a Metro grocery store. Our store is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We used to have, before I started as a retail worker, I worked in an office Monday to Friday. Sunday was family day. We would have what my grandson called bacon and egg day. Every Sunday morning, we would have breakfast. Now that I work in retail, there is no more bacon and egg day, with the exception of the stat holidays. So we're talking about prepared foods. Our store sells prepared foods. And our prepared foods, the amount that we sell, I don't think is enough to keep us open on a stat holiday. Our store has 150 employees and I would say 13% of it are full-time. The rest are part-time, and it's always the part-time that are asked to work, not the full-time. That's because we're paid minimum wage. 
at $11.60 an hour, the store can make a bit of money. But with the amount of prepared foods we have, I don't see how they can. We don't have someone serving the people and they're not sitting down to eat. They're just buying it and going. I don't see how that classifies as prepared foods. And you want to keep this open. Example, our family day on February, which gets me upset, past the Kleenex. <laughs> We get together, we rent a big room and have family day dinner and family time. Because we don't have enough time, we don't have Sundays. Our Canada Day, that's Canada Day. You want us to open on Canada Day? That's another family day. We have fireworks, we have a big barbecue, we dress in red and white. You know, you're taking away all these days if we have to open for our little bit of prepared food. How many rotisserie chickens can we make in a day? How many are going to be sold? Who's going to come in and buy them? You know, this is our fresh to go. You get a pizza. Usually the pizza shops sell better pizza than what we do. You know, I just can't see opening for prepared foods on a stack over there. I don't think it's going to work. Um, as I say, we're all part-time workers, working, you know, precarious shifts. A part-time worker is coming in on a stat holiday. As a front-end worker, we get four or five-hour shifts at 11.60 an hour. You want me to come in on a stat holiday? I have to take the transit. That's, what, three seventy-five a day or $3 a trip? So it's $6. I get a four-hour shift. You know, I'm going to earn peanuts. Then i got to find daycare if I have children. I'm not going to make any money. It's going to cost me to go to work because we only get a four or five hour shift. And if you open for prepared foods only, then you have to have, you've got the people working in the fresh to go. Then you have to have the clerks to clean up after everything. Then you have to have cashiers. So it's not just the food to go that's going to be impacted. It's going to be other parts of the store. Then you have to have someone come in and close the store and check it. And I don't think they're going to earn enough. I don't think there's enough sales. I don't think it's warranted. I think you're really taking away from the family by that little bit of prepared foods. Also, you're going to be taking away business from restaurants that are open and do want to be open. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hedson. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much for your passionate uh, speaking. Thank you. Mary Leonor? Good morning. Good to have you here. Good morning. Um, I would like to bring everybody back to 1975 for a moment. I worked for Dominion at that time part-time. I now work for Metro and I'm part-time now. I would like to, um, I guess, kind of clarify a few things. Um, on the holidays, most people get paid on that day and I honestly think that pay is more than enough for even the few that might want the time and a half or double time. People enjoy those days. The prepared food is what we are talking about. And number um, the recommendation number one and number two, in all honesty, I would vote for neither. I would go with changing 510 to say restaurants only being prepared foods that are 90% of your business. I don't think grocery stores need to be open. I don't know who's going to go there, even, even with the religious differences, etc. And the company in Thorncliffe, I live in that area, they choose to close on their own holidays. And my reasoning and my, my questions are, we prepare for our holidays. We buy pre. We don't go on the day of. Most of us don't even want to shop on Boxing Day, which we lost. Sundays in 1975, I worked at Woodbine and O'Connor in the Dominion store. We were open Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 9 to 6, Thursday, Friday, 9 to 9, and Saturday, 9 to 6. We all got our shopping done then. We all got everything we needed to do then, even for our holidays. Now we've lost Sunday, and it, you used to get a premium. If you're grandfathered, you get that premium. Anybody hired after 2008, May 4th, 2008, does not get that premium. 
we don't want to make it part of our work week. Like we don't want to make these holidays part of our work week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any questions, visiting members? If not, members of the committee, Vice Chair Perry Janis, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Through you to the deputy, and thank you very much for coming today. Did I catch right that people that were are hired after 2008 do not get the premium time and a half or times two? Well, on Sundays. For working on, on the, on the Sundays, staff holidays? On Sundays, it's $1.60. You know, everybody gets paid. We don't have a premium for Sundays because we're not, or I mean, sorry for holidays because we are not open. But the premium I was talking about was Sunday, it used to be $1.60. If you're grandfathered, you get the $1.60 if you choose to work, and you can choose to work. But after our collective agreement now states that um, you will be available two shifts and a Saturday and some Sundays, and you don't get the premium. So I can see if so something like that to happen for the... Oh, it will. There's no... Right. It will. I thank believe it will. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is uh, Councillor Jumpersai, please go ahead. Thank you. So that question led me to a question of clarification. So on the statutory or the holidays, is there anything in the contract? No. Because you're talking Sundays, which is a whole different issue with all due respect, right? Um, but so there's nothing one way or the other. It's not spoken to? Uh, well, the only way is that it, what you will get, like what you will get, you will get paid for that day, but not civic holiday because it's not a, it's not. It's not a stat, yeah, the, the August one, yeah. So though that it speaks to that. But so for instance, if you were to work Christmas, if they were open, does it speak to time and a half or anything like that? Yeah, um, well, it says on holidays, yes, time and a half. Okay, thank you. But may I say one more thing? I don't think that will last long. Like once you start working a stat holiday, that time and a half will go like the dollar sixty. And would you agree that um, ultimately that's between the union and the employer? It's not really. Um, no, but labor laws are there too to protect us. But, but yeah, but that the the nuts and bolts of premium pay is really between the union. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Bernstein. Any other questions? If not, thanks so much for your presentation. And with that, I believe that we ended up the list of speakers. And now we'll go to questions to staff. Is um, Councillor Fletcher? Please go ahead. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions, and I missed what uh, you said at the beginning, Mr. Chair, so I'll just go over that, that there are nine statutory holidays in the province of Ontario. That is correct. And, but in the city of Toronto, uh, our stat holidays are governed under the city of Toronto Act. Or are That's correct. So, and then there, we have always interpreted prepared foods in the city to mean restaurants. That's been how we've interpreted that forever in the city of Toronto for those nine days. <clears throat> yes, traditionally we've looked at the definition of prepared meals as restaurants, yes. And that's how we've interpreted it. But now someone took the city to court and said, well, we think uh, prepared meals are more than restaurants, because they're sold in Longos and other places, and a justice of the peace agreed with Longos. That's correct. And then we took that decision by the justice of the peace, the same person that deals with your traffic tickets, now dealing with whether you work nine days a year, um, took that, that decision and we appealed that. To which court? Was it Ontario Divisional Court? Uh, I'm going to defer that to legal. Corey, can you help with this? Sorry, my apologies. Could maybe Which court do we uh, appeal the Longo's decision to? Uh, to the Ontario Court of Justice. The, so, and, and they upheld the justice of the peace. That's correct. And um, do you think, I, I, I'm not going to ask you if you think justices of the peace are well trained on holiday shopping and bylaws, because I think that part of the answer is no. But anyway, they upheld that. So now we find ourselves in a situation where 
Uh, our, we, have a de we have prepared foods in our bylaw and in the City of Toronto Act, and we have to figure out what, what we're going to do with that because the courts told us that it means you can stay open if you have prepared foods. That's correct, and just to, to be very technical, it's prepared meals in the bylaw and in the Act. Oh, prepared meals. So does it say that in all of our documents, prepared meals? I believe the, the reports uh, have used prepared meals throughout. So prepared meals. So it has to be something that's a meal. So again, prepared meals, which is not a defined term. But if you had to say what a meal was, is it a candy bar? So I'm, I'm not sure if you're asking for my legal interpretation. Yes. Uh, if you're asking for a legal interpretation, what I can say publicly is that it is an undefined term that could okay. be interpreted in many ways. So is it flowers? Different. Would you? So I, I do want to. I, I think that, okay, I'm not, I won't put you on the spot. We, we can say what we think it is because yeah, that's I, our job. I do. So our job today is to say you've put a couple of things in front of us. One's very restrictive around the sale of prepared meals and the other, as you say, is quite permissive around the sale of prepared meals more permissive. So I, I would agree that the two options presented in the report from the executive director, uh, one is more permissive, one is less permissive. One's more permissive, one less permissive. But our, our, if we decided not to do anything and say we think it's only restaurants, do we have that ability here today? Uh, my submission to the committee is no you don't based on the decisions that have been handed down by the courts. Okay, thank you. Councillor Shan, you're next. Just, uh, just a clarification on this. Uh, so there are a number of stores that have, you know, everything else in the store, but on the front you will have this heated equipment that has buns or something like that. And, and so those places would now, if we go ahead and pass this, would be allowed to open on this, based on the concept that a bun that's being heated in there uh, could be a prepared meal, always a prepared meal. Right, so <clears throat> as we've heard throughout the discussion and the debate, it's very difficult to define prepared meals, and that's what we're trying to seek direction from committee here today, is how permissive or restrictive do we want to be. We are looking for your direction on that. Um, to clarify, when you would come in for rotisserie chicken or a pizza or sushi, that is traditionally what we're uh, thinking of as a prepared meal. The challenge is, uh, with some of the wording, is is also the selling of provisions of goods or services in the form or in connection of prepared meals that is also a challenge. Okay. So do we currently have, um, so if there is a multi, uh, if there is a convenience store, for example, um, and it has... Uh, convenience stores are exempt. Exempt from that, right? So there, so what, would this be a kind of a, if it was to be passed, would this do you see this actually giving an option for some of the businesses that may traditionally not be allowed to open, but with an addition of this prepared meal section in their place, be able to open as a result of that? Are there any categories of businesses that you can see that happening? Uh, what this will allow for is uh, grocery stores, large or small, um, to decide if they want to open or not, and then again, what based on what the restrictions are. Have we done any impact on the workers' side of this as a city? If this was to happen, what number of workers would be impacted? What would it mean in terms of our transportation offers and all this stuff, like across the city? Uh, I can speak to the impact to workers um, based on information that I have from my colleagues in city planning, based on our employment survey and my colleagues in ECDEV. Um, this is 35,000 workers, 25,000 of which are with grocery stores, which we have 405 in the city. And we have 841 pharmacies in the city, which impacts uh, 10,000 workers. So 25,000 in groceries, 10,000 in pharmacies for a total of 35,000. While on these holidays, they wouldn't all be working based on some of the deputations we've heard that it's roughly could be between 30 and 40 percent. So roughly 30 to 40 percent of about. And, and again, I'm using I don't have the exact number because it's difficult to say what would be required. Um, based on me listening to the deputations this morning, they said it would require approximately 40% of their workers uh, to be working on those days. 
Okay. Have there been further impact of that? Like, so, so what I'm asking is now we have the number of the workers, but in terms of we are, city offers transportation, city offers daycare services and other things as well. Has there been any, con any kind of analysis deeper into, into how this would impact the other services that we provide on those days? So in our consultations, we heard that transportation would be an impact, it would be difficult to get there. We also heard from childcare, uh, the childcare would be difficult. Childcare is, all, is already a difficult situation in Toronto to have a number of spaces and it would be uh, exasperated by, not, by them not available on, on these statutory holidays. So yes, it would have an impact from a transit perspective and an impact from a childcare perspective. Any other areas of impact other than those two categories? Those are the two main ones, Councillor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is um, Councillor Di Giorgio, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple of things for clarification. I thought I heard at the beginning of the uh, staff's um, presentation that the intent of the recommendations, whether it's one or two, primarily one, let's say, was to allow community council to have some input on possible definition or expanded definition of prepared meals. I thought I heard community council, or is it directly to council? Directly to council. So to be clear, our recommendation is loosely worded to allow you to make a decision on how permissive or restrictive you want to be. So that's, and we've articulated this through the, the questioning. So the recommendation allows you Understood. to pick option one or two or modifications thereof and put those on to council. Understood, but in, the, in looking at possibly amending the definition of prepared foods, because it seems to be so nebulous, do we require additional input at a community council level from the public as to how they feel about the, a particular definition? No, we don't require that. I, I would not recommend that. Okay. Um, the second question is, with essential services, those people involved in essential services, whether it be police, firemen, or what have you, um, do they get time and a half on working on um, holidays? Uh, I'm not certain of that, but it would be in their collective agreements and they would have to follow those. No, but I suspect the collective agreement does, uh, does provide that. I, and the reason I, I asked the question is because uh, one of the deputants said <clears throat> that if in fact um, we allow, you know, businesses or uh, food stores or what have you to be open, that they for, the, in their view, the whole notion of one and a half times uh, pay on holidays would disappear. And I guess my question is, if that's the case, and someone is involved in essential services, why would we even entertain one and a half times when essential services are well paid? Um, so again, our division has no involvement in the, the payment arrangements or the labor relations piece, and the Employment St uh, Standards Act is really what governs that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Giorgio. Uh, Deputy Mayor Glenn Libramica, you're next. Uh, thank you, through you uh, Mr. Chair. I, I think to the appropriate staff, but they may be on a, maybe more of a legal basis. Um, when looking at the report, we have recommendation one and two that says a little permissive or a lot permissive, but they're both permissive. And I thought reading the report, and maybe you could help me and the committee members understand that the justice of the peace interpreted the meaning of the exemption, et cetera, et cetera. But isn't it the city of Toronto that provides that exemption or defines that exemption? Or is it the provincial government that defines the exemption? So uh, thank you, that's a great question. So the city of Toronto Act, uh, so the province of Ontario is the one that limits the city's authority to be able to prevent stores selling prepared meals from closing. So it's a provincial legislation. I'm sorry, and sorry, could you say that again? I didn't catch it all that. Uh, so in the short answer is it's provincial legislation that governs how the city can regulate closing hours and prevents the city from regulating closing hours for sellers of prepared meals. So although we were given the City of Toronto Act, I'll call it there was a restrictions or a confinement of what we can and can't do we interpreted it a certain way, we were challenged and we lost. So we can't change our bylaw to make it more restrictive? 
That, that's correct. The city's bylaw uh, replicated that same limitation of using the wording prepared meals that is contained in that exemption or limitation in the City of Toronto Act. And the justice uh, found that the prepared meals exemption was broader than the way staff had operationalized that as meaning limited only to restaurant providers. And through Mr. Chair, if, if that, if Longo's um, was considered exempt because of provincial legislation, what would stop a Costco or a Walmart? Because I re referred to in the report that, you know, if we change things, we will not allow Walmarts, for example, to open. My question to you would be, well, why not? Wouldn't they have a legal argument as well? So I'll, I'll be careful about how I answer this in public. Perhaps if there's an appetite, we could discuss this more in camera. Uh, certainly, given the broad nature of the wording in the City of Toronto Act and the limitation, there are opportunities for other parties to attempt to interpret different meanings to the wording. So should we, as, as a committee and council, be defining that word more or, or is it just a provincial matter or that exemption more? Given that the wording is broad and, and the source of it comes from the City of Toronto Act, there are concerns if the city were to attempt to define it in a way that could be inconsistent with that. So then it comes back to the province because the province put it in the City of Toronto Act? That's correct. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And um, Vice Chair Kajanis, you're next. Thank you, Chair. To you, to staff. Um, thank you for all the work that you've done to date on this file, and I know that must have been a difficult one. My question is, um, this is only for prepared food. So if you go to a Loblaus and you want to buy a rotisserie chicken, you want to buy sushi, that would be available. But wouldn't Loblaus say, you know what? Uh, everything else is also prepared food that we can go uh, like a sandwich that was prepared the day before but it's on a, a different rack so yeah that's that's the challenge we're facing in de defining prepared meals and what is uh, what is prepared and what is not and that's why we're looking for direction to clarify that and because it's really important that we give clear rules to the industry that's operating this, clear rules to the employees, and clear rules to the public of what is available, and then clear rules for us to do uh, associated enforcement. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. As, um, as Speaker, Councillor Francesciata, you're next. Thank you. Me? Oh. Okay. Um, so... I'll just start your time once again. Please go ahead. Yeah. What was that, Councillor Fletcher? Madam, Madam Speaker, Councillor Nusiera, you have the floor. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I guess... Um, now, what if, we did, what if we decided not to do anything? Uh, I'll defer that to Corey and legal. So uh, certainly that's the state of affairs we have today. Uh, the court decision has created significant uncertainty into how the bylaw can be enforced and what businesses uh, and what types of businesses uh, are able to be opened. Uh, if the bylaw weren't changed, that uncertainty would continue. I think it would continue to undermine the city's ability to ha effectively enforce the provisions as they are. So then to enforcement, how, how, are we, um, how are we going to implement the enforcement? So again, the, the enforcement is a challenge and that's why we're looking for clarity around this. We need to remove the ambiguity that is currently associated with prepared meals. And again, that's what we're hoping for direction from committee and council to provide that clarity so that we can do associated enforcement. So some of the challenges could be, and some of the other questions that were asked, uh, prepared meals, uh, it could be frozen foods, right? Again, again, that's the challenge, and that's, so, that's what we're looking to do. Traditionally, what people think of is the rotisserie chicken, the pizza, and the sushi. Yes. It's the others that are yes. concerning, and that's why there's there's also opportunities for 
limiting the space. I, I know, and so this is very, very confusing. Now, as, as Cal uh, Councillor Fletcher mentioned to a number of the deputants, is to enclose, like just, to, for, for example, Shoppers Drug Mart, some of these, uh, you, the one side they have, they have the prepared foods and then the pharmacies on the other. And what they do is they, they, they close off the aisles. That's what some, some of the Shoppers Drug Mart does. I know, because um, So how is that, so how is that gonna be enforced? Like how would we enforce that? Again, it is challenging. Like, I, no, I know it's, but. Because this, businesses keep emerging, are yeah. different types and uh, in my local Shoppers Drug Mart, the, the food items are on the second floor. So it's not as easy as the traditional grocery store where you come in, prepared meals are right up at the front where you could close that off. So then it would be up to the, dis uh, so every, for example, let's say Shoppers Drug Mart, every Shoppers Drug Mart, wherever they are, they would have to um, have some sort of policy in place where the cashiers, the cashiers would only accept the prepared foods at the, at the, at the cashier. If they have anything else, they would have to refuse. I mean, that's the only way it's gonna work. Yeah. Unless you have somebody standing there watching everybody what they have. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Through the chair to uh, yeah. Councilor Nunzia, yes. The, from an enforcement yeah. perspective, yeah. if those rules were put in place, such as you could not have access to certain types of products, laundry, detergent. For on your computer, on your... The how, how a business would operationalize that would be their their call. Yeah. From an enforcement perspective, if we had rules such as that, our officers would have to do random inspections or investigate complaints of a store to see if in fact those products were made available because a store could barricade them off, for instance, and not let customers access them or if they were given free access to would a cashier, would they be able to purchase so those would be some of the potential enforcement options of how we go about it. And obviously that would have challenges, but it would also provide more clarity than we have today, which is very difficult to enforce. And being that, if we, if we uh, implement that, that you might get some of the retail, some of them say, oh, well, it's gonna cost me thousands of dollars to, to, to bring this in and even just decide not even to open at all because it's gonna be more costly than it would be as far as profit. That would be strictly right? up to each business owner to make a determination of what the cost would be to implement whatever rules are yeah. put in place, just like they are today. So it would be more difficult, so, okay, thanks. Thank you, Councilor Burnside, you're next, please. Thank you, uh, through you to staff. So I believe you mentioned there are 35,000 workers that would be potentially affected by this uh, any changes to the legislation. How many workers currently are um, potentially working on a stat holiday citywide? Uh, it's a difficult number to say how many could be working. What I do have is that the holiday shopping bylaw as it's currently constructed, um, protects 136,000 workers in the retail, grocery, and pharmacy areas. Yeah, I, but I'm looking at uh, TTC workers, police officers, people at Tim Hortons, um, bookstores, whatever. You, have, you don't have any data, right? I don't have that data other than okay. the total number of city jobs in the, in, in the city is 1.461 million. Okay, thanks. And in the retail, it's 331,000. So the bylaws that currently stands, would. It seems, would you agree that there's a sort of a random nature to it? I believe uh, exempted premises include, to quote, retail businesses with less than 2,400 square feet and no more than three persons. What's the difference between 2,400 square feet and 2,500 square feet? Uh, 100 square feet. Um, but the... You know, when I asked that, I... I <laughs> sorry, sorry, Councillor Burnside. It was an accurate answer, but I wasn't poking fun. Um, but we You're right, it's, it's, it's probably enough. not based on an algorithm or something exact. This would have been, uh, and I don't know if it came from the province, it may have, because we are a, we basically, this is a cut and paste from the provincial uh, bylaw. So it, it does, there's an exact science behind it, and you're right, businesses have changed. So judging by the laughs, uh, I think one could infer that it is fairly random and nonsensical. 
Anyway, that's uh, you don't have to answer. Um, okay, in terms of the, um, there's the that one line and, and the ambiguity. Um, Restrictions on the size of the store, yeah, we know that, and the number of employees, and includes retail establishments selling goods or services in the form of or in connection with prepared meals. We heard from legal that to actually change that uh, definition would be problematic. Um, one of your recommendations has something here potentially saying, well, 50% or whatever that number is in connection with. Isn't that by its very nature, given that we, ha we can't even really define what a prepared meal is, isn't it going to be hard to figure out what 50% is? So the 50% re relates to the size of the store or to the, to the sales related to food. But you're right, you're, you're picking on what is the challenge with this issue and defining prepared meals and all the associated pieces, and that's why we give you two options for you to consider. Right, but so just to be clear, I understand the 50% is the size of the store, but if you can't define what, a, define what a prepared meal is or what's in connection with a prepared meal, yeah, I'm gonna, how, how would you actually define what 50, how would you actually count 50% if you can't figure out what the definition is? So I'm gonna, again, it's a challenge and I'll defer that to Corey and legal. Yeah, and I think that that's, uh, the recommendation there is, is intended to provide some kind of metric or way to put parameters around what a store selling prepared meals would be. Uh, so we certainly think that there are opportunities to provide some reasonable limits, uh, again, open to interpretation and, and obviously challenge. A challenge, challenge is the key word there. And so coming back, so even if we do define, then for an enforcement, um, if we defined anything in connection with, so you can sell the prepared meal and actually you can sell ketchup for, for that prepared meal, you would actually physically have to go out and either this is to staff that way, um, either go out and, and get sales numbers or start taking a tape measure and figuring out the actual square footage and then figure out what that percentage is. That's probably fairly time consuming, wouldn't you say? Yes, and so you're identifying some of the challenges that we're having uh, with this and again, the associated items as well. And I guess just in a bigger role of government or certainly in the uh, municipal licensing section where you have a large, um, enforcement is a large part of your job. Isn't clarity one of the most important um, aspects of your department is that there's, there's clarity so people understand what they can and what they can't do? So absolutely that is our, our intent is to get some clarity on the ambiguity that we have right now and I'll let Mark jump in on the enforcement side. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor, you are correct that both for the customer, the public, who we do, who are subject to our enforcement actions, that clarity is important so everybody understands the rules as well as our officers so they know when we're laying charges and obviously we don't want to be tying up court time, prosecutor time, laying charges where we don't have that clarity. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions? If uh, not, I do have a couple of questions and I'll try, try to be very brief. So in your recommendations, at this point you are not making any recommendations either as it pertains to option number one or number two. Simply you are asking direction from council to report back to this committee with recommended uh, amendments on, the, um, on what's before us. Is that, is that uh, what we're looking at? Uh, our recommendation, again, is, is looking at expanding the prepared, is trying to give some clarity around the uh, prepared meals exemption, and then we've provided, again, the options to help do that. I'm just looking at the um, two options, and it seems that uh, my issue with either option at this point is the definition itself. And um, now option number one, it's, I believe, is the more palatable one in my opinion, but still when I read that grocery stores, even though the, you may restrict the 50% or whatever, but it's so unambiguous and so unclear, because still up in the air, so, and option number two, it's even more liberal and less restrictive from that perspective. So once again, the definition aspect, 
Do you think that there is room between now and city council? And this question is to city staff of the legal department to see if there is a need maybe to, to report directly to council with regards to the definition itself in terms of clarify that so we won't have that kind of debate at city council. So I need a little bit of clarification on that. So we, we can report directly to council on uh, opportunities to define prepared meals. Uh, I will say that there's a portion of that that isn't legal in nature. It's a policy decision about what the extent of prepared meals are. We have questions today about would that include things like flowers or not. Those are policy questions and not necessarily legal. And I do have one of the motions that um, I believe that it was checked with you as well and uh, city staff that I'm planning to move. Would that be in order and also would that be supportable from your perspective in terms of bringing something new to council that will help to the, with the definition itself? Yes, Councillor, I, I believe uh, the motion I've, I've seen is, uh, is reasonable and uh, certainly in order. Thanks so much, no further questions. So now as uh, members of uh, the public, members of the community, members of council, we are just getting to 12.30 and either I'm going to need a motion to extend and complete the whole agenda or simply will recess, recess now and reconvene at I have a motion to extend and complete the agenda, Mr. Chairman. Recess. Okay, we have a motion. Well, then, to at least complete this item, because I have another appointment. Point of order? There is some of us that have that appointment. I understand, So, but I have a motion before, uh, before us okay. from Councillor Di Giorgio to complete the agenda. All those, all those in favor? To complete the item. To complete the item. It's just hold on. Now you change is to complete the item only, not the agenda, the, the item. The, to complete the item. All those in uh, favor? Against? Against to complete the item. Okay. You are for? Okay. We have a motion from Councillor Di Giorgio to complete this item, not the agenda, the item. Is, um, so that's before us right now. Those in favor, in support of completing the, the item. Okay, against, just one, one second, please. No, I thought Councillor Bonson wanted to complete the whole agenda. No. Okay. Just so for clarification purpose, I'm being advised by the clerk. We're very clear, it's just to complete this item, not the agenda. Okay, great, thank you, fantastic. So now we'll go to uh, speakers. And the first thing is, um, Visiting members, and we have Councillor Nathan Shan. You are the first one. Okay, I'm sorry, that Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Fletcher, you, no, no, you're absolutely right. No, no, it's, that's right. I, I'm looking at my notes now. Please go ahead. Thank you, and I hope not to take too much time. But it's very good to see all my friends here again, that we've come many times to talk about holiday shopping. And I do believe in quality family time, just like you and appreciate my days off with my family. Council has spoken. Each term we've spoken about holiday shopping, about the nine days, and we have said that in the City of Toronto, the nine statutory holidays must be maintained. We have had attempts by large malls, we've had attempts by grocery stores, we've had attempts by um, pharmacies to make, to have us change our bylaw so that everyone would have to work on those days. And each time we've said, hands off our stat holidays. People need their time with their family. Now there are exemptions in holiday shopping bylaw. As we've heard from legal, there are exemptions. Transit ex is exempt, 911 is exempt, emergencies are exempt. Also, any business, retail business, can open up 2,400 square feet of their business to conduct business. That's in the bylaw. That's legal right now. So any of the big stores that we're talking about, they could open up only 2,400 square feet. Apparently, they choose not to. It's really not economical to open up 2,400 square feet when you're a, a 200,000 square foot store to open up a tiny portion of your store. 
The city traditionally has said that prepared meals, we all understood prepared meals. You go to a restaurant to have a prepared meal. When that got taken to court by Longos, the justice of the peace, yes, the same person that goes there when you say, I wasn't speeding, take my ticket down, my dog bit somebody, but it's a nice dog, the same person said, everyone that prepared meals is something else and everyone who works in that industry would have to work. The city got blindsided with that. We did not expect that to be the case because we've always said prepared meals means the prepared meal. So now we have to add prepared meals into our bylaw somehow and our city of Toronto Act, they all have to go together. I know what a prepared meal is. I don't put down a carton of eggs and a frozen piece of chicken in front of my family and say, well, there's your prepared meal. We know that's not a prepared meal. Any person understands that, and if we get in trouble again, I think we'll be in much better shape to attend court and have many more people define a prepared meal as something that you have made and that you're going to eat right away. It's not the can of soup that you have to heat up and everything else. It is prepared for you to eat. I wish we could simply say our prepared meals means only restaurants. We heard legal and we heard our MLS say that is not what it can mean. So we have to keep this as narrow as possible. I do have stores in my ward that have been charged. Mr. Schragen knows that. They open up 2,400 square feet and then they think, well, maybe I might as well just open up all 5,000 square feet, bang. Now they have a charge. Now they're calling me, counselor, why do we have to close? Well, because you've opened up too much of your store. We do it all the time to the point where one of them doesn't bother opening the store anymore. The other gets charged regularly until they figure out it's easier not to open the store. So we have a lot of enforcement ability to do those things and I'm very, very, very familiar with it. So any person understands prepared meals is not cat litter, it's not frozen foods, it's not flowers, it's not laundry detergent, and we have to keep that prepared foods area because we're required to as narrow as possible. And I understand that Councillor Kergianis has a motion that will, I hope, make that happen, um, that he's worked with legal, he's worked with MLS to come up with a definition that tightens this up to the point where it might not be worth anybody's while to sell prepared foods when you're working in a 250,000 square foot store. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Shan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think it's, it's very important to consider this uh, conversation through an equity lens. And I, I, I know there were parallels being made to police officers uh, and certain other professions. A, some of them are essential. B, if you look at the type of workers we are talking about, precarious employment, low paid, um, the comparisons has to be realistic for us to make that, uh, make that happen. Because um, a worker, a police officer, for example, being mistreated, uh, or being intimidated by the boss is different from a retail worker who is on minimum wage, who has a, a vulnerable situation, maybe in language barrier, maybe young, um, would not have the same type of access to justice. Uh, so it's very important for us to keep that in mind. So to assume that workers have a right in this situation um, is completely false because we heard from workers, and many of them are unionized workers, to have a protection of union. And if you talk, talk to non-unionized workers, it's even worse. Uh, if you talk to newcomers, if you talk to people with language barriers, people who have had uh, difficulties accessing justice to begin with uh, would be able to take uh, employers to court or employers to justice. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's a false assumption. So I think it's very important for us as a city. We need to make sure that we take an equity angle. I haven't heard much more than how many workers would be impacted. Uh, we need to look at this further to see what the impact on childcare, what the impact on transit, and, uh, and other things uh, should be. It also doesn't make sense, uh, the argument that uh, workers will be able to make more money uh, and the employers are doing this so that the workers will have a better chance to make more income uh, is also troubling and, and laughable because if employers were really uh, caring about workers making more money, they should just increase the wages to a decent wage. They should be giving them more hours within the work week on a regular basis so that they can have a sustainable income rather than to be pointing to this as a way that employers are actually making it uh, feasible for more workers to make more money. And I don't think that argument sells 
looking at who's working what and who's working, working for minimum wage. So I strongly suggest that, you know, in addition to the confusion around prepared meal, I strongly suggest that every policy decision we make uh, have a strong equity lens to it, and this one does not pass the equity lens as far as I'm concerned. This has many holes in it. This is going to affect the most vulnerable, most, uh, most marginalized, racialized workers. And we heard from many unionized workers who are able to come here through the advocacy of unions uh, and their training and so on, but there are not a lot of non-unionized workers who do not have the voice and aren't able to even come here to make those presentations, and, and we need to be th to keep that in mind as well. Thank you very much, uh, and I'm hoping that the council councillors here will take that into consideration. Thank you, Councillor Shan, and uh, Councillor Paul Ainsley. you next. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, I encourage the members of the committee not to, to support expanding the, the guidelines or the parameters of what a prepared meal is. And I'm going to speak to it from a number of different perspectives. First, as a city councillor, um, one of the things that I'll point out to is we have a fair wage policy and a fair wage policy office that's had that policy in effect since 1893. And we have an obligation um, to look after people that aren't always well looked after by their employer, whether they're unionized or non-unionized. Um, my history, going back to, I worked for a grocery store in, uh, in high school and university, and it was a, a unionized work environment, Rel religiously paid my union dues every two weeks. And I can remember when the Sunday shopping laws first come into, came into effect, and as a unionized grocery store employer, I was offered time and a half because that's, that's what we were, happened in our contract. And as time came along and the Sundays, the stores were open on Sundays more and more, you had regular time. The time and a half was gone. You were back to regular time. And if you were scheduled on a Sunday, you were expected to work on a Sunday. If you refused working on a Sunday, as uh, some of the deputants met, met outlined you know I can I can think of times where I was asked to work on Sunday and I refused and my shifts went from full-time to I worked three days a week and it was Monday Wednesday Friday and it was basically alluded to me you know if I worked Sunday that though my hours would get better and so you know having a and that's in a unionized work environment and you're talking about a non-unionized work environment in a grocery store or any other of these small establishments on a sunday you don't have a lot of protection and we have an obligation you know a few years ago we created the neighborhood improvement areas that were kind of the 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 follow-up to the strong neighborhood areas and I have a number of them in my ward. And you can talk to people. In, I'll go to one grocery store and I'm buying something in the morning and then I go to another grocery store in the evening for a completely different chain in a completely different location and you have the same cashier. And I was like, didn't I just see you this morning? Well, I, yes, you did, Mr. Ainsley, but you know, I'm working two part-time jobs to make ends meet. And those are the people that are gonna be forced to work on holidays when they're supposed to be spending time with their families. We already have the nine uh, statutory um, days that a lot of them are, have to work. And you know, we have to respect their time. There's precarious work that we're trying to end on a number of different fronts here in the city of Toronto and expanding the, the guidelines or the parameters for what prepared food is, in particular in grocery stores, whether large, small, unionized, non-unionized, is not a road that we want to be going down. So I encourage all the members of the committee not to be supporting the recommendations before you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ainsley. The next speaker is uh, Councillor Burnside. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I would like to clarify some comments that were directed my way. Uh, in passing, I mentioned police officers, but I'm not sure if certain members weren't listening or they didn't hear, but I gave a whole list of other uh, people when we were talking about realistic comparisons. I think people in retail working in tourist areas would be a realistic comparison, as would gas station attendants, Starbucks employees, Tim Hortons employees, restaurant workers, and anyone that works in an establishment under 2,400 uh, 2, square feet, which is primarily um, the variety stores. So I think that's a realistic comparison. But putting, taking, putting that aside, um, there are lots of reasons not to um, 
change things, and and I and I and I sympathize with those. But unfortunately, we're dealing with the reality of a situation which um, no one has really uh, commented on yet, which is the definition of a prepared meal. And that is really, to me, the crux of the issue. We've already heard that the most important thing that we can do is, is well, one of the most important things, it, not necessarily the most important, but a very important aspect of what we do as a government is make sure there's clarity in what we do. Okay, and the back to the original point, it includes retail establishments selling goods or services in the form of or in connection with prepared meals. That is the key problem here. So it's iris and from what I got from legal and what we heard from all of our staff is that is really the nub of the issue. Whether councillors want to uh, expand holiday shopping or they don't, we have to deal with the reality of the situation, otherwise we'll just be back at it again and getting no further ahead. So to me, we have to, um, we've, no one has been able to uh, satisfy me that we can even define or properly define what's in connection with a prepared meal. And until we do that, just pushing things aside and not changing things is actually an irresponsible course I believe that the uh, first option as presented by staff is, is not one that I, um, I think is even manageable and I'd be looking at option number two. Thank you, Councillor Burnside. Councillor and uh, Janis, you're next. Thank you, Chair. I do have a motion. I'd ask staff to put it up, please. Uh, City Council amend Chapter 510 Holiday Shopping by deleting subsection 510 41 um, bracket 1-1, uh, which reads prepared meals and adding as a new subsection the following, the portion of the premises selling food or services in the form or connection with prepared meals, but no other portion of the premises. It's very clear. It's very straightforward um, what prepared meals are. Uh, these are meals that people can go in and, and buy in order to eat at the very moment. Um, I mean, I've heard from, um, we heard from deputants here today that they want to make sure that they do have those holidays off, irrespective of religion, uh, be it a Christian holiday or another holiday, those nine are stats holidays. I do remember last year myself and uh, the councillor to my to my left, immediate left, um, Deputy Mayor Glenda Beermaker brought a motion in that into City Council that we uh, give uh, our staff an additional uh, two days uh, of holidays and make sure that they were also you know on their and their religious holidays. But um, uh, some of the members sitting around this table voted it down, which was very unfortunate. So as we move forward, I want to make sure that. People have the opportunity to spend time with their little ones at Christmas time. People have the opportunity to, think, to sit around at the Thanksgiving table. We as counselors choose a life that probably does not give us the days that we want. Please go ahead. We choose the days that we, they do not give us the days that we want to spend with family. As a father of five daughters, I'll have to tell you, when I got into politics, the first thing that I said was the very next day, my wife was going to reach across the bed and I wouldn't be there. And my little ones would miss their dad when he was driving them to school every morning. That was a long time ago. I miss those days. And I'm sure that we need to make sure that the people that are here today and they're asking us for them not to miss those days, the single moms, the grandmothers that are looking after grandchildren, the people that are working on an everyday basis, it's not the portion of getting time and a half or times two. It's the ability to spend time with their young ones, their families. Have you seen the commercial that says uh, doing that is priceless and then having a MasterCard, that's, it, it's at the top of the world. Spending time with family, it's not only priceless, it is not only important, but it's the cracks of what makes our society. If we're not able to spend time with our families, our young ones will go astray, and then we're gonna say, where did we fail? What programs can we bring in in order to make sure that these young ones get back in line? 
Well, here today, we have an opportunity, a golden opportunity, to make sure that those nine days are with the people that are asking us to support them. They get to spend time with their families, and we get to say that we did something right. Something right that we've allowed that youngster to open his Christmas presents. We allowed that youngster to spend Canada Day or Simcoe Day or Labor Long Weekend with his grandfather or his grandmother at the cottage, or even just to be taken down to the lake or to fly a kite or just to have a barbecue at the backyard. And if you don't have a backyard, have a barbecue in the in in, in the uh, in your in your apartment out in uh, out in the veranda. It is very important. Let's not miss this opportunity. Let's not say to our children, you're not important. Let's not say to the people that are here today, the most vulnerable, the mothers, single mothers that are working. We heard that there's close to about, uh, you know, half of the workforce are, are mothers that are working. Let's not say to them that we failed you. It is very important as we move forward that we do not fail the most important people of our society. These are the women that are bearing the children, the women that are standing up, and the women that are working in order to, to help their families. Failing them, unfortunately, will fail ourselves. We'll fail our children, and when these children grow up, we're gonna say, what did we do wrong? Well, colleagues, the one thing that we did wrong was not allow them to spend the nine days, the most important days, with their families. Thank you. Is we have as Councilor Bernard side question to the motion. Yeah, I do actually want to go there. Thank you. But I think I appreciate the warning, Councilor Karajanis. I'm not sure why you gave it to me. I gave it to myself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure of that. Um, just just for clarity's sake. Um, so how do you you talked about? I have two questions for clarity. Could you put the motion back up on the screen, please? So how, I believe that you're deleting and, and adding the section, the portion of premises selling goods or services in the form of or in connection with prepared meals. Um, so how do we define what that, the, the selling of goods or services in the form of or in connection, how do we define what's in connection? My concern is sort of from the uh, enforcement angle. Um, so how do we define that to begin with? It's very simple. Prepared food is a prepared food. You go in, you take something, you microwave it and eat it. And if you, you know, if you can't understand what prepared meals are, well, I'm sorry that, uh, you know, you still want a definition. Prepared meal is something. No, that you actually, I, I'm sorry. You asked a question. Let me finish. Uh, sorry, let's not be sarcastic. I'm not think being that. sarcastic. Let's be respectful. Sure, I'm very respectful. Yeah, please. Okay. Let's use the okay. same caution to other colleagues. Prepared meal is a prepared meal. It's something that you pick up and you eat. Okay, so I apologize. I guess you didn't understand the question. I actually asked in the form of or connection. The key word is connection. I understand what a prepared meal is, thank you very much. But um, what's in connection? What items would be in connection? Anything that it takes in order to prepare a meal, that is in connection. So ketchup wouldn't be included? When you get a prepared meal and you want, to, you know, ke you want ketchup, uh, certainly you know, the ketchup would be right there. And if it's not, you know, a prepared meal is something. So that's okay, packaged. so that leads me to my second question. I appreciate that clarity. It was very Act helpful. Prepared meal is something that's prepared for you to take away and eat. Connection. The key. I'm keep asking connection. But anyway, okay. So we've. I think you've uh, understand the word connection now. So with ketchup, if it's not there, would you expect the retailer to move anything in connection with prepared meals to an area of the store? If the uh, the store owner. Uh, prepares a meal and that meal uh, needs ketchup, then he will have that ketchup pack available for them to take away. So okay. Everything so that it's, it, it is readily available for a prepared meal. You know, we can pick on ketchup, you can pick on, uh, on barbecue sauce, you can pick on hot sauce and all that stuff. Let's not play with words. The words here, and it, what we need to make sure is that the people that are sitting out there, the people that presented to us, the people that asked us, we do not let them down. You can play with words, counselor, and you can have uh, the word catch up, and you can have this word or that word, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, those holidays are very important to those kids, and nothing else we do, nothing else that we say, we shouldn't fail them. 
Okay, but if it is very important from a legal standpoint, and I know you have some knowledge of, of the law, is that we actually do clarify what is in connection with for an enforcement um, perspective. But anyway, irrespective of that, last question. Um, you, you moved this motion because you want to, um, I, I know you said about, about children and families um, and, and maintaining um, that, that, those nine days. How, does this motion in any way help the people that work at gas stations, Starbucks, uh, restaurant workers? No, I'm just asking for clarification because he said that's so important. Uh, sorry, Councillor Fletcher. I interrupted, I does, it, does this motion address that? That's this all I want. This motion addresses the people that are in front of us. This motion Thank addresses you. the people that are here to ask us that we do not fail them. Anything else, we failed them. Anything else, we are letting them down. Anything else, not only we're letting them down, we're letting their families down and their youngsters down. So I would say to you that you'll have to look at a youngster of the single mothers or the, the grandmas that are here and say to their little ones, we really don't care about you. We really don't care about if your mom and your dad are spending the time with you. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> the next speaker is... Oh, uh, questions, I'm sorry, Councillor De, De Giorgio, you're next. Yeah, just, I thought that you, you wanted to speak, okay. Well, just in the context of enforcement when it comes to your motion, Councillor Corrigianis, I'm looking at it from the perspective of the um, cashier. So here's a cashier and someone comes with prepared foods and anything connected with food, but all of a sudden they decide they bring detergent to the cashier. You're saying to me through this motion, that the cashier basically has to say, sorry, that, that detergent's got to go back on the uh, shelf. Well, is that fair? The, 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 the question then arises is why didn't the uh, store owner rope off that area so people can go and get the detergent? Understood, but I'm just saying it may not be physically possible to rope off all the areas that are not, you know, that they shouldn't be in. So what I'm saying is the, the, the best place to catch it is at the cashier level. Yeah, that would course. be at the cashier, yes. Yeah. Okay. And it will be at the discretion of the cashier. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions as it relates to the clarification of the motion? If not, we'll go back to speakers. As we have um, Deputy Mayor De Vermeke, you're next. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll be supporting Councillor Kerjianis's motion and I'll call it maybe the option one, the more restrictive option. And I do want to think that, thank the deputants that came out today because it, it really is helping to educate me. I may be past university age or certainly past high school age, uh, but I, I have to say after 14 years of being in this, uh, a member of council, I am still learning uh, from people both on the labour side here and on the retail council side. And I, I have to stop and reflect because there are arguments on both sides. Uh, what, is, what, are, what is our role as city councillors? Why are we here? What do we legislate? And certainly I have sort of think that we're here to decide what type of community we want to live in, what type of society we want to live in, what type of quality of life we want our residents to have. I see that every council meeting when we discuss whether we should have more daycare or less daycare, whether we should have lifeguards at swimming pools or not, whether we should have cricket pitches or not. Um, our, our role as councillors is to really say for, for our whole community, what type of quality of, of life do we want? And I certainly know because I, I worked at uh, pizza places and at, uh, in, at the shopping mall when I was in my youth. Um, there are people willing to work on holidays. But does that mean we should just open up and allow everybody to open uh, on holidays? And, and my answer is no. Uh, I know, I, I, I represent Scarborough Centre, it is a working class community, it is a very diverse community, and am I aware that there are people in my community who would be willing to volunteer to work for less than minimum wage? Yes, I know that. There are people out there who will work. They would, you know, if they had to compare you versus somebody else, they would um, work for less than you for a whole bunch of reasons. But is that good for the person who's willing to work for below minimum wage? Is it willing for people to say, you know what, I'll work any day because I'm either young or I'm old and I want the money or I need the money, so I'll do anything. I'll work on any day. My answer is no. I think the government, the role of government is to say, you know what, there should be some days in our society that are days of rest. 
that are family days. The majority of our uh, statutory holidays have nothing to do with religion. They are days where we pause and rest and we think about our history, our country, our families. Yes, there are a couple of religious days in there. Uh, I'm not a religious person. I don't practice religion. I don't, I am not offended that we uh, have Christmas as a, as a holiday. It, it is a day for me and my family and all of my neighbours, wherever they may be from, to stop and pause and celebrate. And I think, you know, and I look in, and, and people have said, well, what about people who work in Tim's and the gas station? I don't think they should be working on those statutory holidays. I think that I've got so many days that I can go and get gas for my car that I don't need those nine days. I know what they are in advance. I know when Canada Day is. If my car really needs some gas, I've got lots of days before Canada Day to go and check my fuel tank to make sure I go get my gas. I really don't need to stop at my local gas station on Canada Day. I don't really need to go to my metro or to the Costco or to the Walmart or to the superstore on Canada Day. I really don't. I'm sure there are people out there who said, yeah, but when I'm out there on Canada Day, I'd like to pop by into the Costco. Yes, you would, but as a society, do we want to work or have people working as a society 24 hours a day, 365 days a year? And I, I, I reflect, I, I know, it's just, it's just wrong. It's just not what we should be doing. Somebody, one of the deputants brought up Ebenezer Scrooge. Even he didn't work 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, we have to have some ability uh, for Tiny Tim and his father and his mother and his family, for all of those people to come together and you say, you know what, we may not be together on most days, but we're together on these days. And right now there's only nine of them. And uh, some councillors who have talked uh, are, are correct. Uh, hospitals are open on those statutory holidays. But I can tell you, Scarborough uh, General Hospital is in my ward, those hospitals uh, are, are staffed by people who understand they're an essential service, they have to be there. They don't want to be there. I haven't met a, no a doctor or a nurse at Scarborough General who actually wants to work on Christmas Day. Of any ethnic or religious background or wherever you may be from in the world, nobody really wants to work on Christmas Day but they do because they understand the importance of the hospital. But I can tell you, and I know, those hospitals have skeleton staff, as they call them. They don't schedule uh, surgeries and anything else on, on Christmas Day and on the statutory holidays because their own staff, the well-paid doctors, the less well-paid nurses, the, the support staff, they are on a skeleton staff and only emergencies, and again, if you're having a baby on Christmas Day or New Year's Day, the staff are there to protect you. Same with our TTC staff. Our TTC staff don't really want to work on those statutory holidays. They accept as bus drivers and subway drivers that they, some have to be there, but we're on a skeleton staff. Same for the police, same for paramedics. So again, I, I look at it and I think, you know, the provincial government, uh, you know, we, we live in a real world, has put this loophole in here, this ambiguity here, and people are marching in. Why? I, I can understand the profit incentive. They want to make more money. But really, I've, I live close to, you know, I, up the street from a superstore. Do I really want to go into a superstore that has a little fresh food section and it has clothes? I mean, I don't want to be shopping for sandals and a t-shirt and sunglasses because the bylaw says that any store that has prepared foods is now allowed to open. That's, I, I don't think, the intent of the bylaw. I think we should minimize this. I think we should allow people to uh, enjoy some time. And I think if I could go the other way and make sure that people in Tim Hortons and gas stations and, and those small stores close, I actually think society would be better for it. So I'll be supporting uh, restricting the ability of people to open on those statutory holidays. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. You made it on time. You see, that's amazing. Any other speakers? If not, I have a motion that I'd like to have a display is um, that the Executive Director of Municipal License and Standards report directly to City Council on November 7, 2017 with a definition of prepared meals and proposals which would prevent any premises from operating any portion of a store that's not within the defined areas of a prepared meal. 
this motion has been has been um, prepared in conjunction with our legal staff as well as our city staff from municipal licensing standards. And um, now, first and foremost, I want to thank city staff for for this report. There has been a tremendous amount of work, and uh, during the last few months, and uh, and through public um, and. Uh, um, meetings and so on. Also, I want to thank all of you, all the deputants for attending this meeting and for talking passionately about what it matters to, to you, to your families, to all of us. Thank you for being here. I want to thank members of council for feeling so passionate about it as well. Now, it's, um, the purpose of this motion is uh, to bring further clarity to what's even before us within those two options. And I think that um, City Council, as we move forward with this item to City Council, I think that members of Council have the right to, to have before them every single possible legal solution that will not end us in court once again. That's why we're here. So it is essential to have a clear and ambiguous Guidelines, guidelines, and um, personally, let me tell you, I have a real sense of what it means to have a family. I have a real sense to have children, and I know what it means as a, a city councilor when I have to sacrifice my own family life because of commitments that we have. Is and it's not only within those nine days, statutory holidays, but all throughout, to miss dinners and to miss holidays with them. I know how difficult it is. It's extremely difficult. And at the same time, I understand how important it is to, to have these days off that you have spoken about it. Is um, perhaps those are, the, those are the only days, the only holidays that families have and you have. Most, a lot of people, a lot of people do not have money, for example, to travel during summer months or winter months down south or wherever. Most people don't have the money and the funding perhaps to go to the college on holidays with their families and to enjoy is our holidays as we, as we do, it's, and uh, so that's a situation that we have to be more mindful as we move forward. There is no need to sacrifice our family lives, and I think that's extremely important. And I am convinced, my friends, that any further changes to the holiday shopping by law will hurt the most vulnerable in society, the poor, those who are struggling to survive, those that may become even victimized even more because of the uncontrollable corporate appetite that's been shown over and over again. This is morally wrong, socially condemnable. I do not support anything that becomes more liberal than what it is. So I hope that these recommendations will bring more clarity to, as we move forward and we do the right thing for our families, for our society. Thanks so much. Questions, Questions to the mover. Thank you. I'm, I'm actually just a little bit confused given the, um, the previous comments of, of legal. So is it possible that we could have legal comment on, on this? Absolutely, I'll be more than glad to ask uh, our legal department I'm to, just confused, sorry. to comment on this motion. Certainly. Uh, so as, as I noted in my comments, the wording of prepared meals in the City of Toronto Act is broad and undefined, and there is a risk were the city to adopt a definition that were narrower than that broad meaning or that a court would consider that broad meaning that of course we'd conflict and there would be a problem with the definition. That wouldn't necessarily pre prevent council from adopting a definition that is consistent with the prepared meals meaning, meaning a very broad definition itself, which would still be open to interpretation. So 
So I'm now I'm, I'm even more confused. So is this problematic or not? That, that, you, one one word, yes or no? Is is this motion problematic? First half. Well, hold on. So it certainly well, could be question. depending on the definition adopted by council. Okay, thank you. So I didn't hear. Any other questions for clarification? Or oh, yes. Is um, Deputy Mayor? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for a very uh, great, uh, I'll call it speech or presentation to us. Um, in terms of your motion, would you consider it a friendly amendment if we broke it into like an A and B with the definition of A, prepared meals, and B, proposals which would prevent any premises from operating? I've, is um, anything that strengthens Sure. what we are trying to do in terms of the definition. I would like to see something, I don't want to see loopholes in either or options one or two, and I'm hoping that that will prevent that so it will be very restrictive and clear. Okay. Is um, if you are proposing to, to break the motion to, to prevent any premises, that would be... Well, is that what you mean? Well, what I, I guess I have concerns of, with us as a council trying to define the words prepared meals. Um, I certainly support the second half, which I think is basically the same as Councillor Kerr Giannis's motion. Um, that, that's my question to you. Is I, I have a concern with the you know of, of us, if you will, making that definition. So would you either do, to remove that amendment. clause? I'll be more than glad to do that. Okay. Is uh, the purpose of this motion was actually to bring a little bit more clarity from uh, from my esteemed colleague, uh, the vice chair, where he talks about in connection to, and there were a few questions with regards to that. On this one is to prevent that, so it's to make it more clear. Okay. Uh, so through through you, Mr. Chair. So if if you are satisfied that Councillor Kerr Giannis's motion was. I'll call it strong enough to do what you and I just said publicly we want to do, then you'd be happy almost to remove that motion and just support the one motion. As long as it works, for, okay. that's, that's okay. intention, that's a purpose. I chance. don't have a problem. Maybe we can just talk offline a little bit too, if we have time. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, I'll ask of legal. So, apart from a definition of prepared meals, does Councillor Palacio's motion also basically say, even if we have a very restrictive definition of prepared meals, we want to exclude any proposals that tend to isolate the prepared meals part of the facility from the remainder of the facility? So you can put that motion back up. I just want to make sure my interpretation is correct. Oh, it's up there. Okay. So, Councillor, uh, Councillor, uh, the beer maker is asking that we break that up into two separate votes. Is that correct? Is uh, members of council, members of council, I think that to make it much easier because I think we're on the same side and I, we don't want to bring more confusion to it. I'll be more than glad to withdraw this one and I will ask you to support Councilor Carijani's motion because it only makes sense. I th yeah, it's, uh, to, avoid any, to avoid any confusion there is um, the sole purpose of putting this forward was to bring more clarity and to avoid the ambiguity that We'll deal with that at council, but we are on the same side on this one. So here we have, uh, I'm withdrawing this one. All those in favor of the withdrawal? Okay, so we have uh, now one motion from uh, uh, Vice Chair Karjanis. Is, um, and I'm going to ask, okay. And then, uh, Mr. Chair, in a point of order, is, I think Councilor Karjanis, is that effectively moving option one? Uh, and I'm, mov I'm moving. Because I don't see moving option one here in the motion. No, this is strengthening. Okay. And then we, so we have a motion before us. Councilor Jones, all those in favor? Against, it carries.
great is um, so now uh, can I have a motion to recess and we'll return at in one hour from now at 2 15 2 15 is uh, uh, the bar maker all those in favor thank you It was just Burnside who was uh, huh? Burnside was against. <laughs>